Oh, it's anyway. Recording? Yeah, I think it's recording starts. Okay, yes. so um, welcome um, to fourth uh, Muller workshop. There is a multimodal learning and applications workshop. Um, unfortunately, this year we have to do it again in the virtual. So let's hope for next, next year or next years, we can do real, physical ones, face-to-face -face ones will be much better. So I'm Michael Jan from University of Trento in Netherlands. And together with um, my co-organizers, uh, Vittorio Moreno uh, from RIT and uh, University of Verona and um, a Pietro um, Peronio also from RIT and uh, Paolo Rota um, from uh, University of uh, Toronto in Italy and Bodo Losenheim from um, Lapland University Hanover. So this is fourth edition and so in the past, we had the first one uh, in Munich um, during ECCV 2018, and then second one in Long Beach during CVPR 2019, and then third one um, jointly with the uh, cross-model learning event uh, in the virtual during uh, CVPR 2020. So this is the, the fourth edition of virtual again. So a few, few words about um, and the submission, some numbers. So in total, we got 32 submissions and each paper got minimum three reviews and then plus um, one meta review. And due, due to the very short um, time period in one month review period, so we, there's no rebuttal. And then in the end, there was a PC discussion for each paper to be accepted or reject. So in the end, um, we have 16 papers got accepted and due to the, the space or the slot of this workshop. So we have half day workshop and yeah, but some also reject papers also have very high quality. So it's kind of borderline rejected. And so here's a, a rough a program for today's um, and workshop. So the first session um, starting uh, from welcome from us. And then with uh, one keynote uh, from um, yeah, Rogerio on adaptive multimodal learning for efficient video understanding. And afterwards, there'll be one um, first oral session and there's eight papers um, on language and, and vision. And there's a second session starting with a keynote uh, from Lorenzo on, on vision using sight, but also sound and speech. And afterwards, there'll be second oral session with another eight papers on multimodal learning. And then the third session in starting with a keynote from Costas on events and this versus frame-based vision. And afterwards, there's a, a few uh, closing remarks. And then afterwards, then we move to the um, gathering for the poster session. So with all the posters there. So, so many thanks um, to um, all of you uh, participating in this workshop and also of the authors of all the paper authors and also to reviewers and we put the reviewer names so it's very long in our uh, website. And of also thank, thank you uh, for the keynote speakers, Lorenzo, Costas and Logrio and also our sponsors, CVF. So we're hosting the, uh, yeah, the, the video afterwards. Okay, thanks. Uh, so I will hand over to Vittorio um, for the first session. Okay, so thank you, Michael. I hope uh, uh, all of you can hear me. Let me introduce uh, Rogerio Smith Ferris. Actually, um, Rogerio, you can start sharing uh, your slides if you like. So Rogerio uh, is a well-known figure in the panorama of computer vision uh, worldwide. Actually, it is principal scientist uh, and manager at the MIT IBM Watson AI Lab. He joined IBM in 2006 uh, after receiving a PhD from University in California in Santa Barbara, actually one of the most beautiful campus I ever seen. Uh, but he also worked uh, in uh, before University of Washington and the Columbia University. 
Uh, his uh, main research work is related to uh, deep learning methods and computer vision, of course, uh, related to uh, computation, which are computationally efficient, but also using uh, less data or less labels. Actually, it is a mix of supervised and supervised learning in a deep learning uh, uh, era, which is actually quite challenging and interesting. And uh, of course, uh, um, Rogerio is not only involved in a very uh, top tier research, uh, being author of many papers in the major conferences, NURIPS, VPR, CLR, ICCV, CCV, but also it is uh, um, authors of many patents and his work is also in a way, apply, uh, it was applied also to real products. And this is actually, uh, one of the most uh, interesting characteristic and, uh, and from my perspective also the, the, the perfect uh, figure as a scientist uh, nowadays. So let me thank uh, Rogerio to, for accepting our invitation and uh, to give his talk. And uh, please Rogerio, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for the introduction, um, Vittorio. Can, can you hear me well and see my slides? Yeah, yeah, I, uh, yes. Okay, excellent. Yeah, and thank you so much for inviting me to give a talk in this very cool workshop. So I'm gonna cover uh, some of the work that my team is doing on adaptive multimodal learning for efficient video understanding. So as you know, in recent years, there has been a huge growth of multimodal video data. Uh, here are just a few statistics from YouTube, which I think are interesting. So there are more than 500 hours of video that are uploaded to YouTube every single minute. So you can see in this plot, uh, the growth per year. And people just love watching videos. There are more than a billion hours of video that are watched every day in YouTube. Just the video Despacito has more than 7 billion views. And this growth is happening not only on social media, but also in many other application domains. For example, in self-driving cars, we have lots of videos from cameras and also all information from other modalities like LiDAR, as an example. In safety and security, we may have cameras that operate uh, both in the visible and infrared uh, spectrum as well. Now, many of these applications uh, require uh, fast inputs real-time processing. It, and this is very challenging for video because video is expensive to process. So motivated by this application, there has been a lot of work recently on uh, model compression and acceleration, particularly in the context of video understanding. Here I'm listing just a few models like um, the TSM or temporal shift module, uh, the X3D, and more recent also we have efficient uh, vision transformer uh, models. And they all try to reduce the number of parameters or speed up computation uh, in deep learning. Now, one observation that I want to make here is that most of these methods, they rely on one size fits all network models. And by that, I mean that these models, they apply the exact same set of features for all inputs, meaning, all computation, the same exact amount of computation is applied to all inputs, no matter their complexity. Now in this talk, I will focus instead on a class of neural network models that are adaptive, dynamic for efficient inference. So these are models that can dynamically reconfigure themselves depending on the input to adjust the computation. So we start uh, with some early work that we did on efficiency, uh, efficient inference for image classification, which is uh, called block draw. And then I will move to dynamic uh, neural networks for video understanding, describing a method that we call adaptive resolution network or ARNet. And then I will describe uh, the extension of this work to multimodal learning, covering a method that uh, we call ADA MML, adaptive multimodal learning. And this concept of um, dynamic neural networks is aligned with the conditional uh, computational concepts that was coined by Joshua Bendio a few years before. So let's start with block drop. So the motivation uh, for this work is 
do we really need to run, let's say, more than 100 layers of a residual network to classify a very simple image, like, like this dog, uh, where you may have a frontal face or a very clean background? Now, there is a very interesting work by Andrea Spate and colleagues that was published a few years back uh, at NeurIPS, where they show that if you randomly drop residual blocks from a residual net at inference time, performance is not affected much. And this is interesting because residual nets, they have these skip connections. So if you drop a block, you still allow information to flow through these residual connections. In contrast to other architectures like VGG, that if you drop a layer or a block, it's just a disaster. Now, this work basically um, uh, dropped residual blocks randomly from our model. The question that we uh, are interested in is, is, is there an optimal way that we can drop these layers or residual blocks depending on the input image? So for example, if you have these simple images of dogs here, you, you would expect to drop more blocks and therefore you would um, be able to process these images more efficiently. However, if you have uh, more complex images, for example, the, the images of these dogs, and, and you can see that there are some bagels as well here, uh, then you would likely drop less blocks because the, these are more complex images and you would likely spend more computation on them. So our idea, which is called block drop, basically consists of predicting which blocks to drop condition on input image in just one shot without compromising accuracy. So we do this by using a very lightweight policy network. So this policy network you know, could consist of, let's say two or, or three residual blocks. This policy network receives as input uh, the, the image itself and produces as output basically a vector of zeros and ones, which indicate which residual block of the model should be executed and which one should be dropped. Now, these decisions are discrete. So you have keep, drop, keep, drop. So it's difficult to use uh, standard back propagation here because uh, they are known differentiable. So what we did was to use reinforcement learning instead and, and the reward is we, we take into account not just the accuracy, but also the efficiency. So in terms of accuracy, we want to make sure that when we sample, um, let's say a sequence, uh, a trajectory of uh, uh, block drops, a sequence of drops, we would like to make sure that if the uh, prediction is wrong, then uh, we penalize uh, the learning algorithm. At the same time, if the prediction is correct, we would like to reward if you use less blocks. So if you use less blocks, you would spend less computation on that particular example, and you would like to uh, maximize both accuracy and efficiency. So we train the policy network uh, jointly with uh, the backbone. Initially, we freeze the backbone, and then we fine tune both uh, together. So we obtained uh, 20 to 36 percent uh, computational savings uh, in terms of flops in ImageNet, and um, the method compares well with other adaptive uh, computation methods. And in principle, the method is complementary to other model compression uh, techniques like pruning and quantization. So you want to mention also that we extended uh, the block drop idea uh, to transfer learning, where we have a similar policy that decides which layers of a network we should fine tune and which layers should be kept frozen, shared with the pre-training model. So this paper was published at uh, CBPR 2019. And we also extended this work to do joint multi-test learning uh, in a method that we call AdaShare, which has a policy that decides which layers should be shared across tasks and which ones should be um, executed independently. I'm not gonna go into details about this work, but just want to give the pointers. So let me move now to the second part of my talk, which is extending uh, this uh, dynamic computational uh, approach to, to video. And I will describe a method that's called Adaptive Resolution Network or ARNet. 
So as you know, videos are redundant. And the question is, do we need all frames of a video to make a prediction? So if we have this sequence of frames, it, it's clear that you would likely um, be able to eliminate most of the frames in order to find out what's happening in the scene, for example, a specific action, because this is very redundant. At the same time, there are videos where you may have less redundancy and you may need uh, most or even all of the frames to make a prediction. So this decision is very input dependent and also depends on the content um, of the video. For example, you might have uh, blurry frames or the quality may not be good. And for those frames, you would like to remove in order to make a decision. How about spatial resolution? Most methods for action recognition, they actually process all video frames at the same resolution. And here we have an accuracy efficiency trade-off. So if you use high resolution, then you have usually more accuracy, uh, but less efficiency because you spend more computation. If you decide to use low resolution, then usually you uh, lose some accuracy, but then your method is more efficient uh, because you spend uh, less computation. Now, the key idea of ARNet is to adaptively select the right data at the right level of the tail, meaning resolution, to make video recognition more efficient. So in other words, we want to identify which frames are important for making a prediction. And not only that, we want to identify the resolution of these frames uh, that we could use to maximize both accuracy and efficiency. So here is the uh, high level overview of the approach. So you have on top, let's say a, a video where um, it's basically a set of frames that were uh, uniformly uh, sampled uh, from a longer video. And then you can see, um, for example, for the first frame, you would decide what resolution you would need for that frame. Um, for the second frame, you may use a, um, a smaller resolution, as you can see here. The third frame, you might skip. So basically these decisions are made uh, by our system. And then uh, once they are made, you can uh, compute the predictions for each individual frame and then average uh, then in order to um, get your final inference, in this case, making a sandwich uh, action uh, category. So here is a more uh, detailed uh, overview of the approach. So in the left, you can see uh, the, the sequence of frames and we use resolution 224 by 224. Now, each one of these frames is fed into a policy network. Again, this policy network is very lightweight and it receives a very small resolution version of the frame in order to make a prediction. We also plug on top an LSTM just to make sure that we can aggregate information from previous frames to make a decision. Now, for each frame, we then have an FC layer that will decide which resolution to use or whether to skip that frame. So the options that we have are um, 112 by 112, 168 by 168, 224 by 224, and we can skip, uh, say, four frames or two frames or one frame. And once uh, we have these decisions, then basically, these frames that were resized, uh, they will go to different backbones for different resolutions. So this is inspired by the compound scaling in efficient net, which basically says that if you have a smaller resolution, then ideally you have a smaller backbone as well. So each one of these uh, backbones will uh, produce uh, different predictions um, per uh, frame. So for each frame, one of them would be selected, make a prediction, and then you take all the frames and um, average them to make uh, the final prediction, which would be making a sandwich uh, in this case. I want to point out here that uh, instead of using reinforcement learning as we did uh, in block drop, here the decisions are still discrete, but we use instead uh, Gimbal soft maxed uh, sampling, which is a simpler approach, which allows us to um, sample from a discrete distribution. And um, this sample, we, we are able to 
uh, backpropagate uh, through the policy uh, network because it's a differential way of sampling. Um, and that allows us to uh, train uh, both the policy network and, and, and these backbones uh, jointly using backpropagation. So on the left here, uh, you can see uh, the results on the activity net uh, data set, and we have results uh, also on other data sets um, in, in, in the paper uh, as well. And um, you can see the plot in the X axis, you have flops, which is basically the efficiency, and um, the Y axis is uh, the accuracy, mean average precision. So ideally, uh, the, the better you are on the top uh, left. And you can see that we get very competitive uh, results um, compared uh, to other approaches uh, like, like eval and a frame, uh, SC sampler, and, 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 and so on. And on the right, you can see the policy uh, distribution on ActivityNet. Um, and you can see that, for example, here, uh, skip four, uh, as you look in, in the uh, X axis. So the, the, the X axis basically tells you which resolution you are using and uh, how many skips you are making. And you can see that skip four, skipping four frames is actually um, a decision that is not made very frequently in, uh, in this data set. Uh, but, but again, this is input dependent. So it may be possible that you have another data set that you have much more redundancy and you would use this decision more frequently. So here are some qualitative results. Uh, you have this action, for example, cleaning four. Uh, and here the system first decides to start with a small resolution, then uh, it increases the resolution in the second um, frame. And then uh, you can see that this is sufficient to make a good prediction and all other frames, they are discarded. Uh, similarly, in the uh, example below, uh, the action fireworks, uh, we have the initial frames, they are just discarded because they are irrelevant. And then the system decides to operate at low resolution and increases the resolution and is able to make a prediction. And then we have uh, other examples of um, medium and hard. And then by medium and hard here, I mean that uh, more computation is, is spent uh, compared to the easy uh, case. So making a salad here, uh, you can see that we start um, with low resolution and high resolution and some frames are um, you, you're skipping all because of redundancy. And then you get more information to make a prediction. In assembling a computer uh, here, you use more frames and more resolution, possibly because you have, um, you know, this is small scale objects for which higher resolution is more important or the, the action itself might be more complex. I want to point out that Along the lines of dynamic neural network models for video understanding, we have also um, VA, RED, and Adafuse. Both of these methods were published at iClear uh, 2021. Uh, VA, RED, uh, too, the, the, basically idea, the basic idea is to uh, use a policy network that can tell you which features to run. And for the others, you just reconstruct the features using cheap uh, linear operations. Whereas Adafuse basically uh, has a policy network that decides which uh, information to reuse from previous frames. So I, I won't uh, describe this approach in, in this talk, but, but again, I would like to give the pointers. Okay, so let me move now to the third part of my talk, which is extending this approach to multimodal learning. So I want to uh, make two observations here to motivate our approach. First, for a given video segment, not all modalities may be required or relevant for recognizing a particular uh, action class. So in this example here, we have the action running and it's possible that the associated audio, the commentator might be talking about uh, something that is irrelevant. So in this case, the RGB video frame information would be a relevant modality, whereas the audio would be irrelevant. Second observation is that some modalities require more computation than others. So it's well known, for example, that optical flow is much more expensive um, than uh, RGB processing and audio is actually much more efficient uh, than, than RGB. So different modalities, they have different computation. 
So the key idea, which we call uh, other MML, um, adaptive multimodal learning, is to predict which modality to use for each video segment, condition on the input, so as to maximize the action recognition accuracy and efficiency. So here the idea is that, um, for example, you may the system might decide to just uh, compute optical flow for just a few frames, just because it's um, um, you know it's very expensive, and use audio more frequently. Um, the key goal is that we, uh, in the end, maximize both the accuracy and efficiency, and adaptive select the modalities in order to achieve this goal. So this is the high-level overview uh, of um, the approach, which is very similar, you know, to the approach that I described before for imaging and, and video classification. Uh, so here on top, you have different uh, segments of a video. So you can think of a segment as a one second, uh, you know, uh, snippet uh, of the video. And for each one of these segments, uh, the system will decide whether it should, uh, for example, in the, the first one, you might just skip all modalities because the segment is just irrelevant. Or in segment two, you may use just one modality like the RGB modality. Uh, or in, in segment three, we might use all the modalities, RGB and audio in this case, and so on. So we do this prediction uh, per segment, and then we basically aggregate them in order to arrive at the final prediction uh, mowing the law in, in, in this case. So here's a more uh, detailed uh, um, overview of the approach. So we have uh, on, on the left, we have these video segments of different modalities, RGB, motion, audio. They are fed into a policy network. Again, very lightweight policy network with an LSTM uh, on top, again, to model um, the temporal information to make uh, more informed decisions by taking into account previous um, uh, decisions that were made uh, before. So we take the hidden state of the LSTM and then we route it to three FC layers. So here three, because we have three modalities and each one of these FC layers will be making binary decisions, whether to use that modality or whether to discard it. Once these decisions are made, then the modalities that were selected, they are fed into this recognition network which will basically will make a prediction uh, per modality. And then we have a fusion step, which is just late fusion with learnable weights in order to make uh, the final prediction. So we use for learning the standard cross entropy loss. And we also have an efficiency loss, which encourages each modality to use, you know, the least number of segments uh, as possible. So just more details about the policy network. Um, we actually tested using RGB defense as a, just a proxy uh, for optical flow as optical flow is more um, computationally expensive. Uh, the input data for um, the policy network is also subsample. So both spatially and temporally. This is just to make the policy network more efficient. And we have a very lightweight backbone, a mobile uh, net B2 backbone. And similar to ARNet, we use uh, Gamble uh, softmax sampling just to address this issue that these discrete uh, this decisions they are this discrete and, and, and that allows us to back propagate um, you know to the policy network to train both the policy network and, and the recognition network jointly. Just some more details about the loss function. Uh, so as I said, we have both cross entropy and efficiency loss. Uh, cross entropy is very standard. We have B as uh, a given video and Y as the ground truth uh, label. And then we have the second term, the deficiency uh, loss. So the efficiency, which is uh, described by CK here, where, where K is the modality, uh, it basically assigns a penalty for misclassification. So if you uh, misclassify a given segment, then you would assign a constant, um, uh, just incurring more loss. Uh, if you make a correct prediction, you still compute the percentage of used video segments per modality. And uh, 
the, the, the idea here is that if you use a lot of the segments, then you would incur more loss. So this is just to encourage that uh, each modality will make, um, will try to use as, um, you know, as few uh, segments as, as possible. Okay, so here are some uh, results. Um, and we have initially tested um, two modalities, RGB and audio in the kinetics uh, sounds uh, data set. So in the paper, we have more experiments in other data sets uh, as well. Um, we have several baselines here. So one is just training each mod modality uh, separately. So you have a uni modality RGB and, and audio. And uh, we have a weighted fusion, which is applying, so, so the, the two modalities are learned jointly, but they are applied all the time. Whereas Adam ML will basically select which modality to use uh, for, for each segment. So you can see here that RGB has 82% accuracy. Audio is lower, 65, but when you do the, the fusion of both, then you get uh, more accuracy. Ada MML actually has a slightly um, or similar accuracy, but note that the goal here is not to improve accuracy. What we want is actually maintain the accuracy, but uh, reduce the computational cost. And you can see that for Ada MML, um, it selects um, 46% uh, percent, um, of uh, the segments for RGB and 94% uh, for audio. So this is basically, this is mostly using uh, the audio um, instead uh, of RGB. And, and that uh, saves a lot of computation. We have experiments in the paper in other data sets like ActivityNet where um, you may get, um, you know, audio uh, to be used less because it's not uh, as, as important. So you can see here that the reduction is close to 50% in terms of uh, cost. We have also tested uh, RGB, uh, audio and flow uh, together. And you can see that the accuracy of optical flow gets in between RGB and, and audio, 75%. The weighted fusion gets a little bit higher, 88. And uh, we tested two variants, uh, one using optical flow um, and, and the other using RGB difference for the policy network. And both in both cases, we are able to maintain the accuracy and uh, get a significant reduction, even more in this case, more than 50%, because optical flow is more uh, computationally expensive. Um, and you can see that um, optical flow is used um, about 20% uh, of the time. So here are some qualitative uh, results. So we have uh, this action uh, cheerleading. And in this case, the system decided to use both modalities um, for the initial segments, both RGB and audio. And then as you move um, you know, forward, you just discard uh, both modalities, probably because you are either confident enough or because you don't have uh, cheerleading anymore. Um, in this, um, um, uh, action here, uh, playing piano, uh, we actually have audio that's used um, almost, you know, all, all, all the time. Actually, it's used almost uh, all, all, all the time. And um, it's just one single frame that, that's, um, or, or segmented that's used to, um, from the RGB to make a prediction on playing piano. And, and, and the reason is just, just based on the sound, you can already recognize the activity. Um, here's another example where, um, in this case, the audio is a similar example of what I mentioned before, that the commentator is actually talking about something different, uh, unrelated. So the system learns to uh, disregard the audio and just focus on RGB um, using two segments. And finally, here we have a case with RGB and flow where two segments are uh, selected from RGB and two from flow, just encoding this motion of chopping the wood. Okay, so I want to uh, conclude now the, the presentation by just briefly mentioning other uh, related projects um, uh, related to multimodal that we are doing uh, in, in my group. Um, 
So one, one project uh, is, is actually uh, very cool. So we, we created a system that can auto curate uh, sports highlights by using multiple modalities. So you can see these bars uh, below. Uh, we have modalities like uh, crowd cheating, commentator excitement, and also action recognition. Like we, we look at uh, if the player is celebrating in order to measure an excitement um, of the player. So we basically measure excitements across all these modalities and, and, and combine them. So if I play this video, this, this is actually a video that was selected as one of the highest scores Today, for excitement. So you can see here the players celebrating and uh, the action recognition and crowd cheering scores are very high. Um, and it shows that uh, both can also be exciting. We have extended the system um, uh, to tennis uh, and we actually deployed at the US Open and Wimbledon uh, tournaments. So the, the official highlights of the US Open and Wimbledon tournaments, they were actually generated by our system, which is very cool. Um, so this work was covered uh, by the New York Times and um, the highlights were watched by millions of fans worldwide. Very briefly, I want to mention other works that we are doing on uh, grounding spoken words in, in video. And this is a collaboration between IBM uh, and MIT. So we have a paper called Spoken Moments at CDPR um, this year, and also other works, um, AVLNet and Multimodal Clustering Networks, which um, consist of learning representations based on video and language. Um, we've been doing also work on grounding texts in images. Uh, I, I, I like this work, Grounding by Separation. Um, where um, if you are familiar with uh, sound separation, the mix and separate approach is, is very popular. What we did here was to uh, do the opposite. Like instead of mixing um, you know, the, the text or, or the sounds, we actually mix the images. And then we uh, try to separate them using uh, the, the text. And, and that allows us to ground the text in the images. And we have this paper at CVPR 2021 also related to grounding texts in images, uh, which is called separating skills and concepts in the big way. And um, that's also, you know, uh, doing grounding without uh, supervision. So just in summary, uh, I presented uh, techniques for dynamic neural networks for efficient inference. In particular, uh, three methods, block drop for image uh, classification, where we do dynamic selection of layers to execute, for efficient uh, inference. ARNet, we do dynamic selection of frame resolution um, for efficient video recognition. And other MML, we do dynamic selection of modalities for efficient multimodal uh, video understanding. Um, all uh, these works, they are actually uh, a collaboration uh, between IBM and several other uh, external um, collaborators. And uh, here I'm just listing the three um, main references that I presented uh, today. And you can check my web page for you know, the other links that I mentioned um, in, in the talk. So with that, I conclude uh, my presentation and uh, thank you very much for, for your attention. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Rod Rogerio. Just a clap for for all the audience. And uh, we have a little bit uh, running out of time, but uh, we have a, some uh, one minute for a quick question. And we have a couple of questions in the chat. So the first one, I don't know if you can, if you can read it, uh, Rogerio. The first one is related to, uh, to the second block of your presentation about the AR net. So what is the real advantage to sample the frames and the resolution if you need uh, to use several different backbones to process frames at different resolution? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so um, first, uh, I, I would say that the only disadvantage uh, is that uh, the number of parameters, because in terms of uh, computational speed, each backbone is actually much, much lighter, right? right? So for example, if you use uh, a, a small resolution uh, image, then you know you, you would route that into a, a very you know lightweight uh, backbone, right? So I, I would say that um, the, the the only disadvantage would be in terms of uh, number of parameters, 
because you need to keep, you know, separate uh, backbones uh, per resolution. However, th th there are ways, uh, and, and we haven't investigated that yet, um, but uh, th th there are ways and, and there, there are actually re recent uh, work which uh, does, you know, uh, uh, one single backbone for, for different resolutions, right? So, so that, that could be potentially uh, used, you know, to alleviate uh, the, the problem of number of parameters, right? But, but with respect to efficiency, you know, if you, you know, select a small resolution, then you'd route to a very, very lightweight uh, backbone, which is also similar to, you know, efficient net, the, the compound scaling uh, scheme. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, we have another couple of questions. Maybe if you have a quick answer, Rogerio. Yeah, I can see uh, the chat here. Um, ah, sorry. So this, uh, let's say, is about uh, activity recognition. Do you think that the idea of the policy network and frame resolution, skipping, oversizing, etc., could be a standard for prediction tasks like segmentation, for example? Yeah, we haven't uh, experimented uh, with uh, segmentation, but uh, Jun's son, uh, you know, he has some, some work on uh, dynamic neural networks for uh, segmentation, uh, which I don't quite remember uh, the title, but he has, you know, shown, you know, some, some results on, um, on, on segmentation uh, as well. Okay, okay. So thank you. Sorry, Christopher. Um, we are really uh, running out of time now. So let's thank Rogerio again for the presentation. Uh, thank you. This amazing work, uh, even uh, for sure the, what you presented, but also the, 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 the last uh, couple of slides regarding the official work is really amazing. And we'll check it uh, over there <laughs> for sure. And uh, so uh, thanks again. Let's go. Let's proceed to the oral session. Thank you, Rogerio, again. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we are now starting oral session one. Um, I'm asking all of the presenters to be uh, quite ready. So as soon as a, a presentation uh, finishes, uh, the next speaker can uh, take over and uh, start uh, his presentation. So uh, we have uh, eight papers for both sessions. And uh, again, uh, I'm asking you to uh, write questions in the chat, maybe with the uh, paper ID as well. So uh, at the end of the session, at the end of the eight papers, uh, we will uh, have a quick uh, question and answering session uh, to answer all of, your, of, all of your questions. So we have now paper number two. Uh, dealing with missing modalities in the visual question answer difference prediction task through knowledge distillation. Uh, I'm asking the presenter to uh, share his screen. Uh, you can either uh, play your video or uh, um, uh, or uh, speak uh, as you like. Uh, in any case, I'm asking you please uh, stick to the five minutes because we are uh, we have a very tight schedule. Thank you. Can I can I start? Yes, please. I think you have you have to activate also the the audio the presentation. I think we don't. Oh, um, I'm sorry. How do I do that? Um, when you uh, share the screen, there is a little checkbox. Oh yeah, yeah. I think I got it. Okay. Hi, my name is Jay Wancho from KAIST, and I'll be presenting dealing with missing modalities in the visual question answer difference prediction task through knowledge distillation. In this work, we tackle the visual question answer difference prediction task, which we call VQD from short from now on. In this task, we are given an image, a question, and we have to predict why the answers might be different. Due to the concurrent VQA and VQD challenges running, the answers are not present at test time. So in a basic VQD model where we, we have the image, question and answer to predict the difference. In the realistic VQD model, we have to use the image and question and predict an intermediary answer and then try to find the difference. To overcome this, we propose a knowledge distillation scheme using individual modality teachers and a big teacher model 
to train a student model which only has the image and question available at both test and train time. In order to distill knowledge well, we first create a big teacher model that uses all three present modalities to outperform previous baselines. In this big teacher model, we have two attentions where the question is attended by the answers once, and then the image is attended by the question and the answers. And all of these features are multiplied and passed through a classifier in order to answer the answer difference. Then we use not just a big teacher model, but individual modality teachers, such as the answer teacher, image teacher, and the question teacher, and distill not, not just the predictions, but the intermediary features from either the NL MLP or the attended features into the student model using an L2 loss. For our experiments, we show our experimental findings on the VizWiz VQD validation set. And first we show that our big teacher model is outperforms all previous baselines by, by a small margin. Then, uh, in order to test to see which of the individual modalities are helpful to train the student model, we uh, distill the individual modality mo uh, teachers. We find that some of the teachers are not actually helpful individually or at all. And we can see some things like the question teacher is actually uh, detrimental to the performance for some categories such as low quality image as the question teacher is not able to see any of the actual images. Then we use different combinations of the big teacher plus image question or or a combination of these individual modalities with the intermediary features as well and find that big teacher plus the image teacher and the question teacher with their intermediary features actually perform the best. Additionally, we show our results on the VQA V2 VQD dataset, and we can also see that our model uh, uh, performs the best among all of the uh, baselines. We also show our qualitative results, and uh, the threshold is, as a sigmoid is applied, the threshold is 0 0.5 for true and false. Uh, we see that even though the baseline may be wrong, that if the teachers are correct, the teachers can guide the baseline into having the right answer. However, there are also failure cases where even though the baseline was correct, when the teachers are wrong, they ultimately distill the wrong answer to the teacher and the, teach and the student will learn the wrong answer. In conclusion, we first propose a big teacher model that makes use of all present modalities and shows a favorable performance against current baselines. And in order to tackle the issue of answers not being present at test time, we use a knowledge distillation scheme to teach the student mod model using individual modality teachers and the big teacher. Thank you. Thank you very much. You can unshare your screen, please, so that uh, the speaker for, poster, uh, for uh, paper number 11 can present beyond VQA, generating multi-word answers and rationalities to visual questions. Hi, I'm Radhika and I'm presenting my work titled Beyond VQA, generating multi-word answers and rationales to visual questions. This is a joint work with Srinivas and our supervisor, Dr. Vineet, and we are from IIT Hyderabad, India. We propose a task with work. We are given an image and a question about the image. We generate a natural language answer and reason that explains why the answer was generated. The above examples also illustrates the kind of visual questions for which a single word answer is insufficient. Application, consider a cancer patient who went to the hospital now, if the model predicted a particular outcome, the model would also generate a rationale to say why it made that particular decision. And this is something we think can be practically useful in many different applications. Here we focus on visual language tasks, which can be of several kinds. Image captioning, where you caption an image. Visual question answering, where you ask a question based on an image and the AI system answers. Visual dialogue, which is like a chatbot that chats over an image. 
visual common sense reasoning where you try to ask more common sense questions based on an image however existing methods approach these problems as a classification problem which in practice is not relevant because we want human understandable answers and rationales which can be expressed in a multitude of ways this motivates a generative model rather than a discriminative model another aspect that we look here is that humans often use a rationale to generate an answer and sometimes even vice versa that is use answers to generate a rationale it means that humans have a close interplay between answer and rationale inspired by this interplay we propose a model for answer and rational generation a model comprises of four lstms where first lstm generates an answer based on that second lstm generates a rational based on that rational the answer is refined and based on that a rational is refined this is how humans answer we come up with an answer then perhaps we think of a rational to back up the answer and maybe based on that rational we we may want to refine our answer a bit and then come up with a refined rational too so at least this is one way in which humans could answer questions and that's what we try to do here we train the model using the sum of four cross entropy losses one for each of these lstms here we present the results so here is the image and the question here is what does this person do and the correct answer is that she, uh, the correct answer that was in this data set is she is a student and the re reason is she is wearing a school uniform what our model actually generates is person 2 is a student and the reason for that is person 2 is wearing a school uniform here is another example which is challenging here the question is what is person 1 doing this is a very abstract question in this case our model fails to generate some semantically correct answer even on this result we observe that generated answer and rational are grammatically correct and complete we now compare a proposed model and its variants against the two against the basic two stage lstm and we qa model as baselines a model outperforms both these baselines across different evaluation matrix we also show results on three variants of a proposed model by using question and image as inputs or question as question and caption as input evidently q plus i plus c model performed the most consistently across all evaluation matrix we also evaluate the performance of variations of a proposed generation refinement architecture we have no refinement module in one variation and in another we have two refinement modules given an image and a question where are they at the generation module generates the answer they are in a library and rational they are there are shelves of books behind them however the generation refinement model generates answer they are in a liquor shop and the reason there are shelves of liquor bottles on the shelf this answer and rational is more accurate and precise we observe that proposed model with one refinement module has the best results both qualitatively and quantitatively apart from automatic evaluation matrix we also perform human turing test to be able to objectively measure a performance in conclusion we propose a novel task we curve for generating a multiword answer and rational given an image and a question our work aims to go beyond classical vqa by moving to a completely generative paradigm we also present an end to end architecture which is based on the observation that answers and rationals are dependent on one another we showed the promise of a model on the vci dataset both qualitatively and quantitatively and also through human turing test we also showed that this model can be transferred to task without ground truth rational Finally, we hope that our, mo our work will open up a broader discussion around generative answers in VQA and other deep neural network models in general. Thank you. Thank you very much. We now have uh, paper number uh, fourteen using text speech image retrieval. This code will describe a new framework for image retrieval and how cats can be incorporated into uh, we, we do not see the, the image retrieval. We now see the just the 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 desktop. Uh, uh, can I see it right now? Yeah. Okay. 
This code will describe a new framework for image retrieval and how cats can be incorporated into it. Image retrieval is defined as given a query image, find the most similar image in a database. This problem is solved in a content-based fashion. The solution is that we will use some image encoders to extract the features of every database images and the query image. Then we will compute the Euclidean distances or the L2 distances between the query image and all database images. The nearest image is finally selected as the retrieved image. Most works focusing on finding better ways to encode the images. But we find that using Euclidean distances to find similar images can be problematic sometimes. In particular, when the image feature is space is sparse, a query image can be far away from all the database images. In this case, the Euclidean distances to the nearest database image can be large as well. We find that the retrieve accuracy is correlated with the negative distances. So for these outlier queries, the retrieve accuracy will be very low. To elevate this problem, we propose to model the image manifold learned via neural network as a graph. In this graph, each vertex will be an image feature and the edge between two vertices exists if they are smaller than threshold. This is used to satisfy the property that a manifold is only locally Euclidean. Once a graph is constructed, we can use the geodesic distances to define similarity. One can think this as gradually find other similar query images until the query image is close enough to the database images. This brings more confidence to the retrieved results. Our method can be further improved by using the corresponding captions of the images. The cat sets are first used to learn a visual semantic joint space, in which paired images and cat sets should be close to each other. These cat sets are further used to construct a graph. As we can see in example here, the cat sets are used as additional dragons toward the database images. The qualitative results here visualize the workflow I just mentioned. We have also quantitatively tested our methods of two datasets. Each image in these two datasets contains a label and a caption. We select a few images as the database image, and our evaluation matrix is records at one. That is, we want the nearest retrieved image has the same label as the query image. The table reflects that our method supports the traditional Euclidean distances measurement. The shortest path found by our method further allows us to consider how well images and touches can be aligned in a joint space. If we consider the path as a series of modification from the beginning image to the ending image, well aligned touches should lead to smooth transitions between images as the one here with the orange boundary. To quantify the concept of smoothness, we introduce a new data set called Clever Change Eater. Clever refers to that the images are rendered by the Clever coated with 3D objects. Change means that we will modify the images by altering the attribute of a random 3D object. Finally, Eater means that we will apply the modification on the already modified images so that this process can be iteratively applied. By doing this, we can define a smooth transition as two images differ by only one attribute. Then we can define a path to be smooth if all the transitions along this path are smooth. With this definition, we can see that a method for joint space learning is effective if the additional catches can bring more smooth passes. In conclusion, we bring a new framework for image retrieval. Our framework can be improved by using catches as additional information. We have also come up with a new dataset and evaluation criteria 
for joint space learning. And that's it. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Uh, we can now move to uh, paper number 17 and improved attention uh, for visual question answering. Uh, just as a reminder, if you have questions, you can uh, post in the chat. Uh, I guess uh, we are, we're all unable to uh, hear the uh, sound. Oh, sorry. Just one minute. Hello everyone, welcome to the presentation of our work entitled An Improved Attention for Visual Question Answering. Our main contribution is a modular co-attention on attention network to capture related information from both visual and textual modalities simultaneously. We also present a multimodal fusion mechanism to incorporate both image and question features to dynamically decide how to weight each modality to generate final feature representation to predict the correct answer. Our proposed network has two primary attention units, self-attention on attention unit and guided attention on attention unit. Self-attention on attention unit is an extension of multi-head self-attention mechanism. Input feature X is fit to the multi-head attention to generate a weighted vector, no matter whether it finds any relation between query and key value or not. So this approach can easily mislead and generate wrong answers for weak way. Therefore, we incorporate another attention function over the multi-head attention module to measure the relation between attention results and initial query. The final attention block will generate an information vector and attention gate through two separate linear transformations and apply element-wise multiplication, which is considered as another attention. The rest of the architecture is the same as the multi-head self-attention mechanism. Similarly, guided attention on attention unit uses attention on attention block and a point-wise feed-forward layer along with the two input features, X and Y, where X is guided by Y. Both attention units are used to generate modular co-attention on attention layer to handle multimodal interaction. Here, X and Y represent image and question features respectively. For both input features, two separate self-attention on attention units are used to capture intra-model interactions separately and then use guided attention on attention unit to capture inter-model relationships where Y guides X feature. Here is the overall architecture of our proposed method. The network takes image and question features as input. Image features are the intermediate features extracted from a faster RCNN model. Each word from the question is transformed to a vector using 300 dimensional globe word embedding followed by LSTM. Both features are feed to an encoder decoder module consisting of cascaded modular co-attention on attention layers and outputs image and question features. Both features are combined together to generate the desired answer by a multimodal fusion module. In this work, we use two types of fusion mechanisms. Multimodal attention fusion, where we apply simple concatenation to combine initial attention features from both image and language modalities and apply a series of fully connected layer to generate weighted features. The final weighted features represent how much importance we should give on each modality. Multimodal mutant fusion, another version of multimodal fusion, where we incorporate mutant fusion instead of concatenation, keeping the rest of the network similar to multimodal attention fusion. We use VQA version 2 dataset to conduct our experiments. The dataset, dataset is splitted into train, test, and validation set. Additionally, there are two test subsets called test div and test standard to evaluate model performance online. The results consist of three part type accuracies, yes, no, number, and others, and an overall accuracy. 
This table shows experimental results on test div and our method outperforms baseline models. The table shows accuracies on test standard using online evaluation. Again, our method performs better than the baseline works. This table shows comparison of our proposed approach with the state-of-the-art method on validation set. Here, we also show each component in our proposed method contributes to increase the performance of BQ system. Here, we present some qualitative results from validation set and compare with our baseline work. Here, Q and A represent a query question and generated answer respectively. Moreover, red text indicates predicted wrong answer for the corresponding question. Here we show some failure cases using our method. To conclude, in this work, we proposed an improved and end-to-end attention-based approach with a novel multimodal fusion architecture. Experimental results show that each component within our model improves the performance of VQA system. Thanks to all. Thank you very much uh, for the talk. It's now time for uh, paper 19, uh, target tailored source transformation for scene graph generation. Okay, Paolo, maybe you have to play this one. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I try to play it. I can play it if it's okay. Please help me because I yeah, I can, I, I can play it. Yeah. yeah. Hello, everyone. This is Wen Tong Liao from Leibniz University, Hanover. Today, I'm going to present our work titled by Target Taylor Source Transformation for Sync Graph Generation. This work is performed during my internship program at Microsoft Research Asia. Sync graphs are graph based representations. They encode the object as nodes and their relations as edges. A general sync graph generation pipeline given an image as shown here. It is first pass an object detector to propose the regions of interest. Visual features are then extracted from these regions through the ROI pooling. These features are also used to estimate the object label for each pair of object. The features extracted from their union bounding box are used as their relationship features. The estimation of object labels, the object's features as well as the relationship features are then encoded into the initialized graph, which is fully connected. However, some pairs of objects do not have meaning for the relationship. Different methods have been proposed to prove the redundant edges. The states of the nodes and edges are refined using contexts such as LSTMs, GNNs, and so on. Finally, the object labels and predicate types are predicted using their refined features, and the final scene graph is obtained. Message passing is one of the most popular methods for context capturing. Taking the work graph RCNN for scene graph generation as an example, messages are passed through the graph using graph neural network. In their work, Attention mechanism is used to collect the information from source to the target. The first step of the message passing is to transform the features of source objects through a linear transformation using a trainable and shared matrix W, which means this transformation is target agnostic. For different target objects, a source object contributes the same information. We argue that a target tailor information is more useful than a common information for a specific target object, and the transformation should be target aware. To address this problem, we propose the target tailor source transformation method as the general pipeline given an image. A fully connected graph is initialized that encodes the object states and relation states 
We propose a semantic relationship features to remove the redundant edges. Each object is embedded using the object labels and word vector embedding. Then, a relationship is represented as the concatenation of the object embeddings and the normalized bounding box. A classifier is trained to decide whether this pair of objects has a meaningful relationship. The object features are refined not only using the context from the neighboring objects, but also the neighboring relations. So as for the relation features refinement. We hope that transformation of the source is targets tailor. Therefore, the input of the transformation are the targets and source together to further explore the context between the different object categories. The object's label's embedding is concatenated to its visual features as input. In this way, the object features and relation features are refined with the context from objects and relations. Objects labels are predicted using the refined features. The final object labels are embedded to associate with the refined relation features to predict their predicate. Finally, the same graph is generated. We use the widely applied recall at K as primary matrix for same graph generation performance evaluation. We benchmark our method against various same graph generation models on the visual genome dataset. We observe consistent improvements in the record at K across different tasks using our framework. Here we show some qualitative example of same graphs generated by our freight work. We can observe that our framework can generate accurate same graph in various things. An obvious limitation is that it falls to detect small objects and their relationships, which is caused by the imperfect object detector. For additional details, results, and discussions, please find our paper. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, three more papers to go. The next one is paper uh, number 25, Private Shared Disentangled Multimodal VAE for uh, Learning of Latest Presentations. Hi, my name is Mihi Lee, and I'm presenting my work with Professor Vladimir Pavlovich about private shared disentangled multimodal VE for learning of latent representations. Real world data frequently comes in multiple views or modalities. For example, a person can be described by her image as well as attributes. To learn the representation of this data, one commonly models the shared latent space of these modalities. However, the attribute modality can represent the invisible properties of the person, which is the private factor that doesn't exist in the image modality. Thus, to represent data precisely, we must separate it on both private and shared latent spaces. To accomplish this, we propose DMV, the disentangled multimodal V. The architecture of DMV is shown here. For example, given paired images of MNIST and SVHN as the two modalities, the shared latent factor of the two modalities would be digit ID, whereas the private latent factor could be the style of each dataset. To jointly run the shared space, we, we use product of the experts model. The product of experts helps the joint posterior assume a closed form as the product of the prior and the individual experts. Moreover, unlike the mixture, mixture of experts, the product of experts focuses on the common space shared by the individual experts' distributions while reducing the variance. It leads to building a consensus between the experts. For stronger separation of the private and the shared space, we supplement the learning with the cross-generation objective. This means generating digit 5 in one lab modality from the image of the same digit in another modality. To validate the utility of DMV, we conduct experiments on two benchmarks. In this experiment, the modalities are MNIST and SVHN digit images paired by digit ID. We expect to learn the shared factors as the digit ID and the private factors as the styles of each dataset. To evaluate DMV, we consider several tests. First, cross synthesis task where the goal is to synthesize data from one modality using the input from another modality. In this graph, 
We assume x, x1 modality is missing, but we generate x1 using the shared factor from x2. We randomly sample the private latent code from the prior distribution. Thus, we cross synthesize SVHN using the ground truth MNIST image and vice versa. For example, in the highlighted column, we input the MNIST digit 2, which is encoded and transferred as the shared latent code to the SVH modality. And the private factor of SVHN is sampled from the prior distribution. Thus, it outputs different styles of the same digit in SVHN. In similar way, MNIST images can be generated with another modality SVHN. We quantitatively verify that these close synthesized digits can be accurately recognized, leading to SOTAP performance over competing methods. We also investigate the learned shared spaces using a TSNE analysis. Each color represents a different digits. Points marked with pluses are the MNIST data points, while the, those shown as dots are from SVHN. Notice that, as desired, the points cluster together according to the digit ID, irrespective of whether they are from MNIST or SVHN. Here, we assume the two modalities are the flower image and its texture descriptions. Image private space contains information such as background image, while the text modality describes invisible attributes such as geographical. Or other visually distinct characteristics, such as bright purple petal, live in the shared space. For evaluation, we consider the cross modal retrieval task. Given a query input from one modality, we retrieve top three results in the opposite modality by maximizing cosine similarity in their shared space. Table A demonstrates that retrieved captions carry the same class label as the query image, indicating correct retrieval. Only the red colored caption in the last row indicates mismatch in class labels between the query and the retrieved caption. However, notice that despite the mismatch, the retrieved text remains highly relevant. In table B, the similar results can be checked from caption to image retriever. We again support these qualitative findings by suggesting the excellent performance of DMVA over competing methods. In conclusion, in this work, we propose DMVAE to segregate the latent representation space into the union of the private and the, and the shared space. And we improve the comparability between modalities by introducing the cross VA task, also by applying our model to image text as well as image image representation modeling problems. We demonstrate the effectiveness of our model. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we can now move to paper uh, 26, Editing Like Humans. Hi, everyone. My name is Sharath Kurathoda, and I'm presenting CMVE, a framework for multimodal video editing. This is collaborative work done between Fovia, Columbia University, and City University of New York. Automated video editing from text is an emerging problem posed by increasing amount of user-generated content and advancements in multimodal learning. It first requires understanding of video through extracting key events, characters, and objects. Next, it requires segmenting videos into clips, which is typically done through dense captioning or clustering to allow for video retrieval. Lastly, it requires modeling creative decision-making by video creators who use editing software to compose a new video from individual clips given some text query. Recent methods have addressed these problems by improving aspects of the editing pipeline, the quality of search, video metadata extraction, or interface design to automate editing workflows. On the other hand, researchers have focused on synthesizing video segments from text, but these are often short clips in controlled settings or require a large amount of raw footage. CMVE is the first pipeline for automated editing where the goal is driven by a storyline of the output video and is flexible enough to edit long-form video. Our approach attempts to create a video given an input prompt, a database of existing videos with descriptions, and at least one reference sample used to weigh similarity between objects, known entities, and perceptual metrics. Specifically, we score the database of videos by text embedding similarity using the universal sentence encoder with the input prompt. Next, we utilize a clip segmentation model to process single camera shots from this database in order to synthesize a new video. For each clip, we capture a representative thumbnail and detect recognizable figures, bounded objects, and unbounded concepts. 
professional video editors often use a reference video to guide their video editing decisions, and so to mimic that, CMVE learns a style vector from a reference video. CMVE places an importance on the retrieval of the first clip of the output video. This clip is then used to dictate the selection of subsequent clips, which are ranked based on the reference score vector describing the similarity to the reference clip. CMVE calculates the overlap between the input text description and within video similarity measures. We learn from the single reference sample by calculating the perceptual similarity of composing shots by mapping VGG feature activations to perceived similarity of thumbnails. Next, we calculate the average cosine similarity between objects and concepts in the clips using standard object recognition models. Lastly, we relate the reference sample video to the reference input query by weighing the part of speech dependency tags of recognized entities. In this way, we learn a single linearly weighted score vector describing the perceptual object and concept similarity of clips in the reference sample, along with an entity score vector that describes how clips weigh recognizable entities in the editing style. During video editing, we synthesize a video compilation for each sentence of the input text query and concatenate clips into a coherent video. We retrieve the first clip based on description similarity distance and entity overlap score. Next, we score the remaining clips in the database using the learned score vector representing perceptual object and entity similarity. We applied CMBE on a news compilation video dataset. We chose a variety of news topics from 2020 relevant to the US news market and selected a total of 12 input storylines used to edit short compilation videos. Each video was also edited by a professional, which we used as a ground truth in assessing the quality of CMBE edits and as a reference sample. We arrived at the following learned entity and similarity weights, which indicates that the editing style of reference samples depended on known entities being the subject of clips and a relatively larger weight on object similarity over perceptual similarity for news editing. We recruited 80 study participants who rated the quality of professional and CMVE edits across all topics. CMVE shows competitive performance with professional edits with less than 5% rating difference on average across topics. We found the performance to be topic specific but found no effect of entity presence on video quality. We provide pseudocode of our implementation along with an online demo of CMBE. On our demo page, you're able to view the professional edit side by side with the CMBE edit. Okay. okay. Uh, looks like this concluded the presentation. We have the last paper for this session, which is paper number uh, 30, exploring the limits of zero shot learning. How low can we go? Greetings, everybody. The title of this paper is Exploring the Limits of Zero Shot Learning, How Low Can You Go? The authors of the paper are Karan Sharma, Suchendra Bandarkar, and myself, Heman Dandu. Thank you all for joining. With advances in computer vision, machines are now able to achieve human level performance on image recognition tasks. However, there are still a few issues such as large number of object categories, difficulty in collection and annotation, and trained class fairs can only predict into classes they were previously trained on. Zero-shot learning frameworks enable predictions even when there are no training examples. Seen classes are the set of classes which are used to train the classifier, and unseen classes are the set of unobserved classes which are used to evaluate the framework. In generalized zero-shot learning, we train on seen classes and predict on a set of seen and unseen classes, making this a more generalized framework. In the literature, there are standardized seen and unseen class splits for datasets. While this has allowed us to find benchmark approaches in terms of accuracy, we feel that a large potential of zero-shot learning is still unexplored since the number of seen classes has always been significantly higher than the number of unseen classes. 
Drawing from this, our objective was to propose a framework that aids in the data collection process to a greater extent. And we do this by trying to infer larger number of unseen classes from very few seen classes. We also establish the minimum number of seen classes on each data set to achieve reasonable performance. We test our framework on three standard zero-shot learning data sets. These are animals with attributes, Caltech USCD birds, and scene understanding with attributes. Our framework broadly consists of five modules. In deep feature extraction, we use a ResNet that is pre-trained on ImageNet to convert each image into its features. Then we extract three sources of auxiliary information for each object category. Attributes, which are present in each data set, word embeddings derived from fast text, and hierarchical embeddings from pre-trained ontologies. Here, we use dimensionality reduction to transform them into a compact combined semantic space. Next, we use clustering on this space to identify representative object categories. And we use two types of clustering, Gaussian mixture models and affinity propagation. Then a multi-label classifier is trained using data pertaining only to the cluster centers. While testing, we generate alternative hypothesis by using a similarity measure between predictions from the classifier and the combined semantic space. The overall metric used to evaluate is the head score, which is the harmonic mean between the seen class accuracy and the unseen class accuracy. We compare our framework with attribute label embedding, which as seen from a previous study, outperforms many other zero-shot learning framework. From the results, we see that our model performs better than attribute label embedding on the our two data set and the CUV data set while having comparable performance on the Sun data set. On analyzing our framework, we find that there are few cases where our model performs well and few where it performs poorly. This is an example of seeing classes where we are able to clearly identify discriminating features such as the humpback whale. These are examples of seen classes where our classifier is unable to clearly distinguish between two seen classes, such as a cow and ox. These are cases of seen classes where, which have fewer images to train on and since we have poor performance, like a walrus and a mockingbird. Similarly, in unseen classes, there are few examples where we have good performance, like inferring a gorilla from a chimpanzee. These are unseen cases where our model performs moderately, like inferring a grizzly bear from a polar bear. This is a case where our model is unable to infer a category because it is too far away from a seen class like an antelope cannot be inferred since deer is closer to the scene class moose. In conclusion, we introduced a framework for zero-shot learning that aids largely in the data collection process. In comparison with attribute label embedding, our model performs better on two of the three data sets. We also established the minimum number of scene classes for reasonable performance on each data set. Thank you everyone for attending. Okay, thank you very much. This concludes uh, the uh, session. Uh, I see there are no questions in the chat. Uh, if you want to uh, speak now, otherwise I can ask a question to uh, the authors of paper 11. Uh, I was wondering, uh, it's very nice, very nice uh, work, first of all, uh, giving uh, an explanation basically of why an answer was given. And I was wondering, uh, what if the model is asked a question which is not uh, relevant or consistent with the picture? Uh, have you tried stressing the model with, with such questions? And what would be, what would be uh, the rationality uh, of like an unrelated question for the, for the image? Thank you for the question. Uh, I think it's a very interesting question. 
so we didn't try unrelated question or irrelevant question but we tried some generic questions which are not um, directly related to the image and so because we we were giving the image information so model was answering based on the content in the image okay yeah, thank I you think in future it would be nice to test on unrelated data unrelated questions too yeah. okay thanks so we're just one minute late for the next session and uh, so i guess if there is uh, no one else uh, willing to ask someone something to the authors we can uh, move on with the next uh, speaker okay so this is Vitali again and my pleasure to present the next talk, next invited speaker, which is Lorenzo Torresani uh, from Dartmouth University and also research scientist at the Facebook uh, AI Research Fair. So Lorenzo is, uh, is not present today. Maybe he could be also attend, uh, since he is traveling, but he can also attend for the question and answer. Um, I hope he can, uh, he can join us uh, later and we will uh, in a way play the video. So Lorenzo uh, has, a long, uh, has a long experience in uh, computer vision and machine learning. Uh, he's leading this uh, visual learning group uh, in uh, Dartmouth College and, uh, um, and also now is a research scientist at FAIR. As I said, uh, his research interest is uh, of course related to deep learning and computer vision. And uh, uh, regarding uh, um, some uh, topics like image categorization, action recognition, depth estimation from single photo and 3D reconstruction of human movement from monocular videos. And recently he has a lot, a lot of work uh, in, uh, um, in the multimodality, especially audio and video. And uh, today he will present us uh, his uh, last work about uh, vision using sight, but also sound and speech. Uh, please, uh, Michael, can you play the video? Thank you. Yes. And uh, as usual, you can make questions in the chat and then we can ask later. I'll... Thank you. Hi. I'm Lorenzo Torresani. Uh, so today I'll be presenting uh, visual models that leverage uh, multimodal data, uh, either at training or test time, uh, in order to address problems that uh, would be either impossible or very difficult to solve uh, by unimodal vision. So I will begin by uh, presenting COBE, uh, which is uh, a method that leverages uh, speech uh, for extending object detectors beyond uh, simple categorization and to train these object detectors to recognize useful contextual information, such as the state of the object, the action being applied to the object, or perhaps additional associated functional objects appearing um, also in the scene. Then in the second part of my talk, I will present uh, uh, VX to text. Uh, which is a, a general framework for multimodal video understanding, where in addition to the raw video, we also have some accompanying modalities, such as audio, speech, or text. And finally, I will conclude with a brief teaser for upcoming work uh, to be presented at ICML this summer. Uh, this is Timesformer. Although it's not a multimodal system per se, uh, it does have a multimodal flavor in the sense that it adapts uh, the transformer from language to operate on video classification. Well, let me start from the first uh, system, uh, COBE, uh, which is uh, joint work with uh, Gedas Bertasius at Facebook AI. So the motivation for this work uh, stems uh, from the observation that uh, many objects in the uh, real world undergo state changes that dramatically change their appearance. Uh, so consider, for example, a tomato. Uh, we, may start, we may start from a whole tomato, then chop it, slice it, or even make it into a tomato sauce. 
and uh, its appearance um, varies dramatically as we perform these activities. And it's clear that training a single uh, detector to recognize the object in all of these forms is quite challenging. It's also clear that uh, there are often uh, strong contextual cues uh, that are highly indicative of the state of the object. For example, the presence of a cutting board or a knife is suggestive of the fact that the tomato is uh, probably sliced or chopped. Uh, say a strainer instead is going to, uh, it can tell us that uh, the tomato is probably in source form. And so we want to design a system that can capture this contextual information uh, so as not only improve the accuracy of detection, but also to uh, infer the functional property of, a, of an object and also possibly to predict the likely human object interactions. However, existing data sets for object detection um, define objects in terms of a, a set of coarse categories. Um, uh, these are typically noun-centric categories. And these categories fail to reveal uh, the states that uh, an object can actually have. So the intent in this work instead is to uh, extend object detectors uh, to recognize this contextual information. So that, for example, when we are given this kind of image, uh, the detector uh, is going to recognize not only that this object is an egg, but also that it's in raw form, uh, that there is an ongoing action of cracking the shell of the egg, and also that there is an associated functional object, which is the ball. So we're not the first to look at the problem of modeling object states and their transitions in images. But uh, to a large extent, all prior work has addressed this problem uh, using a fully supervised uh, approach, uh, consisting of essentially manually labeling lots of images with information about the objects containing them, the states uh, these objects uh, take, uh, the transitions, as well as the actions being applied. And it's clear, that, however, that um, because of the uh, long-tailed and open-ended distribution of uh, the uh, real data in the world, um, it's difficult to scale these approaches to really model all possible objects all objectical, and all possible states and actions uh, applied to such objects. So instead of relying on manually labeled data, we take an a, a unsupervised approach uh, that consists in leveraging um, instructional videos, uh, and specifically we use the narration in these instructional videos as uh, the only supervisory signal for learning to recognize object uh, states and contexts. Uh, we use the How to 100 Million dataset, which is a dataset of 100 million uh, videos um, showing humans uh, performing and demonstrating a wide variety of complex activities, um, such as making arts, uh, cooking, uh, fixing bikes and so on. And although this is uncurated data, uh, due to the tutorial properties of instructional videos, uh, the narrations contained in these videos uh, often provide a very rich description of the objects appearing in the scene, not only in terms of the names of those objects, but also um, in terms of their purpose, uh, how they are used, and also their appearance. So the idea therefore is uh, in our system to use the narration as the regression target to train a visual model to predict essentially this language uh, narration from uh, the individual frames. Specifically, for each object instance in a frame, we want to train the model to uh, predict a language embedding of the fragment that describes that particular frame. And this fragment of, of narration um, is going to contain the name of the object, but also uh, the words that were used uh, to describe that object or um, how the, a certain action is being applied to that particular object. So let me describe in more detail uh, the uh, steps of our approach. Um, so because we want to train an object detector, obviously we need to um, provide a training set of uh, bounding boxes for the object that we want to uh, learn to recognize. And unfortunately, how to handle million does not contain any annotations. So we adopt a semi-supervised approach. Um, effectively, we use a pre-trained object detector to generate pseudo ground truth bounding boxes on the frames of how to handle million. 
We use uh, the Epic Kitchen Detector, which is pre-trained to recognize about 300 object categories uh, relating to um, activities in the kitchen. We apply it to all frames in how 200 million, uh, but we retain only detections uh, where the corresponding narration explicitly names the object detected in the frame. So in other words, we cross-validate the presence of the object by using the frames as well as the narration in order to generate uh, cleaner uh, ground truth data. We also eliminate uh, from consideration uh, classes that yield too few detections in how to 100 billion. So at the end of this process, we uh, were left with about 1.1 million bounded boxes spanning uh, over a half a million uh, frames uh, for a total of 154 coarse object categories. Once again, by construction for each of these bounded boxes, we also have a fragment of narration that explicitly names uh, the object appearing in that particular frame. So now we use these fragments uh, of uh, sentences uh, to supervise uh, the training of a visual model. Specifically, we center uh, the fragment uh, of narration at the word corresponding to the object detected in the frame, and then uh, pump this uh, fragment of a narration into a, um, a contextualized word representation model. Uh, so this is effectively a transformer encoder uh, like BERT, and it produces a language embedding vector which captures the semantics of uh, the word corresponding to the object, but also the uh, adjacent words that were used to describe that particular object in the narration. And so this becomes the target for uh, uh, our regression uh, vis visual model. So our visual model is a modified version of the faster RCNN detector where we replace the traditional classification branch with a regression branch that is optimized to predict the language embedding that we derive from the, from the narration. So we optimize this model using the noise contrastive estimation loss um, by um, sampling as negatives um, language embeddings uh, obtained for objects different from the one detected in the frame. So let me start by showing some qualitative results. Now, um, our visual model predicts in the same space as the uh, language model. So we can use uh, this uh, for interesting uh, cross-model applications. For example, we can start from an object and generate text for that object. Um, and this is shown here for four different uh, frames. Um, so our system detects an object instance in each of these frames, then it produces a uh, representation, which is in the same space as, as language. So we can now find the closest language embedding uh, corresponding to a pair of object contexts. And this becomes, in a sense, the object context uh, label that we attach to this object instance. And so you can see, for example, in the case of the leftmost uh, picture, that the system correctly recognizes the category of the object uh, being oil, but it also predicts the context words salad or vegetable, which are indeed other objects appearing in the scene. And it also predicts uh, the uh, context word drizzle, uh, which is indeed the ongoing action. We can also reverse the direction of retrieval. Uh, we can start from text corresponding to a query of uh, object context words, and then do object instance retrieval from that query. So essentially find the object instance um, whose representation uh, is closest to the language embedding of that particular object context word. And so um, um, we can see here that the different columns uh, represent uh, different object words used in the query, and uh, the uh, different rows in that column represent different context words used in the query. And so we can see, for example, from the second column that our system learns to uh, distinguish different activities uh, applied to dough. For example, kneading the dough versus cutting the dough versus rolling the dough. And uh, this is quite remarkable uh, considering that the learning is completely unsupervised. It simply uses the noisy automatically transcribed narration as supervisory signal. We can also do uh, visual object analogies. Uh, for example, we can compute the difference between two uh, object instance representations 
add this difference to another object instance vector and then use this result as a query to perform a visual search. And, and that's what we show here. So we start uh, by computing the difference between a, a, an instance of pouring milk into a glass and pouring water into a glass. And we apply this difference to uh, the instance of a coffee cup. And then we do a visual search and the uh, closest match is a frame uh, representing indeed uh, pouring milk into a coffee cup. Um, here is uh, an experiment. Uh, um, it's a quantitative experiment carried out on Epic Kitchens and you cook too. Uh, and we evaluate our system on the task of uh, uh, detecting object context instances. And note that in, in this case, we trained our system just on how to 100 million frames. And then we evaluate it without any form of fine tuning on Epic Kitchens and you cook too. So it's a, it's a form of zero shot learning. And despite, it, see, despite this, we see that uh, the accuracy uh, measured as mean average precision is actually uh, fairly high. And uh, we compare our system uh, to tuple faster RCNN, which is uh, a system that has exactly the same backbone architecture as COBE. Uh, it, it is trained also on the same set of how to 100 million frames. The only difference is that it uses a classification branch uh, that is optimized to predict the tuple of object context classes. And you can see that COBE does a lot better, uh, which is a clear indication that um, it is beneficial to treat this task as a regression problem. And uh, doing so allows COBE to leverage the semantic structure of the language. Um, and as a result, it, it produces much, much better results than the tuple faster RCNN. Uh, we also compared COBE to even stronger uh, models uh, pre-trained on large uh, collections of manually labeled data, including ImageNet and Kinetics. And then we take these deep models, deep models and fine tune them again on the how to 100 million examples. And in all cases, we found COBE to provide again, better results, which again is underscores the importance of uh, training the model um, to predict the language embedding as opposed to treating these as a classification problem. All right, let me move to the second uh, project that I want to present today. Uh, this is vx to text uh, And uh, this is the result of a, a summer internship done uh, by Shudong Lin at uh, uh, Facebook AI. And it involved also the joint work of uh, several Facebook collaborators. So vx to text is a, a system uh, designed to address the general problem of uh, generating freeform uh, text from an input consisting of video plus X, where X here denotes um, some accompanying modalities, uh, such as audio uh, or perhaps uh, speech or even text. And uh, it turns out that this problem has actually received quite a bit of uh, uh, attention recently in computer vision under different forms. For example, one instantiation of this problem is capturing, where uh, the input consists of raw video, audio, and optionally also uh, transcribed speech. And then the system must generate a free form uh, caption uh, describing in detail what's happening in the video. A second instantiation is a, a video-based question answering, where in addition to the uh, aforementioned uh, modalities, uh, we also have a, a question um, formulated in text form, and then the system must provide a textual answer uh, to this question. And finally, we also have uh, audiovisual uh, dialogue where instead of having an isolated question, uh, the system actually must engage in an interactive session of questions and answers uh, with uh, the user. And in order to uh, correctly answer the next question, it must also take into account the entire dialogue history. So as you can imagine, uh, in order to do well on this kind of problems, uh, the system must learn to combine effectively uh, the different visual cues uh, coming from uh, the uh, different modalities. And because of this, most prior work in this area has focused on uh, the design of highly sophisticated and complex architectures for modality fusion. And these architectures can uh, tend to be uh, quite complex uh, to the point that most of them require also 
large scale uh, multimodal pre-training, typically on external data sets, in addition to uh, the data set of the downstream task. Furthermore, uh, most of these uh, uh, prior architectures also in, um, in, uh, leverage specialized network heads um, for each individual task out of the three that I mentioned. Uh, instead, we propose an architecture that is much simpler and uh, it actually formulates all three tasks as text generation. And as a result, it doesn't require specialized network heads. And also the architecture remains unchanged irrespective of the uh, specific input modalities. So the approach uh, is based on two simple ideas. The first is to leverage um, pre-trained encoder-decoder um, language transformers. Uh, specifically, uh, we uh, use a T5 system uh, from Google, uh, which is pre-trained on a large corpus of uh, human-written uh, test examples. Now we use uh, both the encoder as well as the decoder in this system. So we use the encoder uh, for uh, language reasoning and we use instead the uh, decoder, um, which is similar to the decoder in GPT-3 in order to generate highly realistic text as output. Now the technical challenge here, here is that, well, these language transformers uh, operate on language. So um, of course, if our multimodal inputs include text, we can directly feed these uh, um, signals into uh, the encoder. But the question is, what do we do with audio and video, which are continuous signals, clearly different uh, in format from the discrete representation used for uh, the language. And we solve this problem in a very uh, simple fashion. Uh, we simply map, map each uh, uh, additional modality into a set of words. And we do so by leveraging pre-trained uh, modality-specific classifiers. So we simply take the top predicted classes for the uh, um, input modality, and uh, we uh, uh, take the names of those predicted classes and feed them to the encoder. So for example, in the case of video, we apply a pre-trained object uh, and action classifier. We take the top predicted objects and actions uh, from this classifier, we literally take the names of those objects and action, and uh, those become the input uh, provided uh, uh, to uh, the multimedia encoder. We do the same thing for audio, except that the classifier uh, in this case is trained on, uh, recognizes some categories, for example, using the uh, audio set uh, data set. Um, and uh, we then pass all of these uh, sets of words together with the transcribed speech and uh, the uh, question uh, to uh, the encoder. Uh, we use separators uh, to mark uh, the sources of the uh, different words so that the encoder knows for each individual word which modality generated that word. And so this allows essentially the encoder to learn how to best combine and fuse the information coming, coming from the different modalities. Then the sequence of embeddings uh, computed from the encoder is passed to the decoder, uh, which generates as output a sequence of distributions over a dictionary of words, where the jth distribution is essentially the uh, is essentially defining the posterior distribution of the jth word uh, to be emitted or to be sampled, and uh, the jth distribution is conditioned on the uh, word j uh, in position j minus one sampled um, in the previous step. And it's precisely this autoregressive uh, aspect that uh, makes the, the system capable of generating uh, sequences of words that make sense together, both in terms of grammar as well as semantics. So we optimize uh, the entire system end to end uh, by using the cross entropy uh, with respect to the uh, ground truth text to be generated. Now, in order to uh, enable end to end training, training uh, we um, adopt a differentiable tokenization scheme for the modalities that um, um, are continuous in uh, original format, such as video and audio, because we need to tokenize these uh, input modalities into um, top class names. And to achieve this goal, we essentially uh, adopt the uh, trick of Gamble softmax uh, sampling uh, during training, and uh, we make the sampling 
differentiable by means of an approximate tokenization scheme. So this makes it possible to train the entire network end-to-end, -end, including uh, the modality-specific classifiers. At the end of the training, uh, given a new test uh, multimodal sample, we simply feed it into the system and obtain the sequence of posterior distributions. Now, we can use these distributions in two possible ways. Um, we can either um, sample one word from each distribution until the end of sentence uh, token is reached. And this is useful for tasks that involve um, uh, free-form language generation, uh, such as, for example, video captioning. For tasks that instead require selecting an answer from a predefined set of candidates, we simply feed each candidate uh, text um, into our model and uh, rank the pro and, and evaluate it under the probabilistic model. And, and then rank the candidates and finally select the highest one. So let me move to the experiments. Um, so here you see results obtained on the AVSD uh, dataset for the task of audiovisual dialogue. Uh, the matrix here are uh, those of the standard text generation. So uh, blue, cider, meteor, and rouge L. Uh, so this is a fully generative task. Uh, so the different matrix are represented by the different plots at the bottom. And within each plot, uh, you see five different uh, bars uh, with different colors. Um, uh, the different bars represent performance achieved with our system for different subsets of input modalities. So for example, the uh, blue bar here denotes a text-only baseline, uh, which takes as input only the question and the dialogue history. And as expected, this uh, particular uh, variant doesn't do too well on this task, because, well, it cannot properly address uh, the question because it doesn't have access to the video or the audio. Uh, but you see that, uh, for example, looking at the orange bar, if we replace the dialogue history with video as input, the model now does a lot better. And adding um, every additional uh, modality uh, produces a gain in performance, which again underscores uh, the ability of our system to fuse together effectively the different modalities. And again, this is done, done in a very simple fashion by simply mapping each modality into a set of words um, and then letting the encoder uh, fuse together this uh, collection of words. Here we compare uh, to the state of the art on AVSD. Um, we found that our uh, method VX2Text uh, outperforms all prior, uh, all prior methods, um, both when using caption with as input, as well as when not using caption as, as, as input. These are the two standard settings in this uh, benchmark. Uh, we also have an ablation uh, demonstrating the importance of end-to-end -end learning using um, uh, differentiable tokenization. Um, our uh, system uh, uh, using end-to-end -end learning does a lot better than uh, the same system um, with frozen uh, modality-specific classifiers. This is the frozen tokenization uh, variant here. And uh, it does also a lot better than uh, the model uh, that does multimodal feature embedding. Uh, this is an end-to-end -end learning scheme that was adopted in previous work. Here you see some qualitative uh, results for uh, uh, dialogue uh, generated by our AI agent. And this is interesting to look at because it really shows uh, the ability of our system to produce uh, sentences that look very realistic. For example, when asked, is the person a man? Uh, the system answers, no, the person is a woman. When asked, what is she holding? Uh, it says she's holding a bag of food. And the last answer is uh, even more interesting. When asked, what's on the table next to her? It says, I can't tell what's on the table. And uh, uh, this is a response that you would expect from a human. Um, our system pro provides this kind of um, prototypical human responses because it, it is indeed trained on large corpus of uh, human written text. Here you see um, instead the results uh, for a different task. Uh, this is video question answering um, on the TVQA dataset. Uh, this is a uh, discriminative task that requires selecting an answer out of four, uh, uh, sorry, out of five candidates. And even on this benchmark, our system uh, does better than all previously proposed systems, um, uh, including the previous state-of-the-art, HERO, uh, when HERO um, is trained 
uh, on uh, um, the same data set uh, as ours, uh, it does actually 5% uh, worse than our system. Uh, the uh, HERO paper also reports uh, results obtained when pre-training HERO on 7.6 uh, additional samples um, corresponding to video with text. Uh, and uh, uh, well, our system actually outperforms uh, even this variant of, of HERO, despite not using at all this additional uh, multimodal data. And by the way, this, this multimodal pre-training of, of HERO um, is very costly. It, it takes uh, three weeks as reported in that paper. And finally, here you see uh, some qualitative results of captioning on TVC, on the TVC dataset. And again, they demonstrate that our system generates uh, realistic uh, language. Um, it also shows that it's capable of recognizing uh, complex activities, such as in the scene on the left, uh, where it recognizes the action of helping to get up from the hospital bed. Uh, notes also that the system correctly grounds the characters, and it does so because it leverages um, cues coming from the transcribed speech. And again, this is a demonstration of the ability to fuse um, um, different modalities together very effectively. All right, let me conclude with a brief teaser um, for uh, upcoming uh, work to be presented at ICML 2021. Uh, uh, this is Timesformer. Uh, it's a new architecture uh, purely based on self-attention. And uh, it's inspired by the Vision Transformer, uh, VIT, which was uh, recently introduced for still images uh, by Google. Uh, the key idea in VIT is to decompose the image into non-overlapping patches and then to perform self-attention over these patches. So our system adapts this idea uh, to uh, video and it introduces a very efficient uh, self-attention scheme for video. Uh, we call this divided space-time uh, self-attention because it divides the attention into two separate steps. First, temporal attention, where the patch is compared to all the other patches in the same spatial location in the other frames of the video. And then space attention, where it compares the patch to uh, the other patches in the same frame. And so this is a very efficient uh, um, self-attention scheme, uh, much faster than dense uh, comparison over all pairs of, of uh, patches, which would be uh, computationally prohibitive. Um, this uh, scalable approach uh, allows us to train our model on clips, including up, up to 96 uh, frames and spanning almost two minutes. And this is a big departure compared to um, 3D CNNs, which are instead are typically optimized on clips of only 16 or at most 32 frames. And uh, this allows our system to achieve uh, state-of-the-art results on uh, several benchmarks, including Kinetics, Kinetics 400 and Kinetics uh, 600. I'll conclude by mentioning that we have already made available uh, code and pre-trained models uh, of Timesformer, and uh, I invite you to uh, send me your question. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thanks, uh, Lorenzo. I tried to, in a way, spot him on the chat, but it seems not to be present. So I think uh, if you have questions about the work, you can direct directly to him uh, by email, I guess. And uh, thanks for, again, for his presentation. And we go for the next session of the oral presentation. Paolo, can you? Yes, thank you, Claudio. Yes, we go through the second uh, uh, oral session and we start, I mean, as usual, we have to move fast. So uh, please uh, get ready when it's your turn. So uh, we can start with uh, ID 01. Uh, Self-supervised feature learning by cross-modality and cross-view correspondences. Thank you. Hi everyone, this is Lono. I will be presenting our work Self-supervised learning by cross-modality and cross-view correspondences. This work is jointly done with Lin and my advisor, Professor Mi Tian from the City University of New York. 3D data is inherently multimodal. Normally, we, we have data of different modalities available for each object, such as point cloud, mesh, and image. 
in this work, we propose two new features from mud only border 3D multimodal data by exploring the cross model and cross view correspondence. Many CFC provides the method have been proposed for 3D data. Mm -hmm. The existing methods include context prediction, orientation prediction, etc. However, the existing methods mainly focus on one method to reach the response cloud. In this work, we, we focus on how to using the correspondence of different modalities as supervision signal for CF super learning. This slide shows the motivation of our method. There are, there are three different modalities. The left shows an example object from the mesh data set, and the right shows the uh, plant cloud and image. So based on the geometric, 3D geometric attributes of the mesh, the point cloud and image can be easily generated. In this work, we propose the two, two novel uh, constraints. The first one is cross-modality correspondence, and the second is the cross-view correspondence. The cross-modality correspondence explores the relationship between the data from two totally different modalities, such as the point cloud and image. And the cross-view correspondence explores the relationship of images captured from different views of the object. This slide shows overall framework of, of our proposed model. In this work, we mainly focus on two modalities, which is image and point cloud. Uh, in total, there are two feature encoders, the F-image and F-P. F-image is a 2D convolution neural network to, to extract the features for image. F-P is a graph convolution neural network to extract the features for the point cloud data. The entire network is jointly trained train with uh, two, cor two correspondence, the cross-view correspondence and the cross modality correspondence. The cross view correspondence is is optimized with the triplet loss. So the triplet triplet loss is trained to minimize the distance of features from the same object. We are maximizing the distance of features from the image of different objects. And the cross modality correspondence is achieved using the cross entropy loss to verify whether the whether the two input features uh, are from the same same object or not, where the two, where for these two features, one is from the image and the other is from the point cloud. To demonstrate the effectiveness of our proposed model, we, we conducted the uh, experiments on multiple data sets. We mainly, uh, we mainly use a model net 40 and a shape net. The model net 40 is uh, for the 3D classification task, the shape net is for the hard sanitation task. Uh, first, uh, let's look at the performance of the predicted tasks. The left shows the cross modality correspondence verification accuracy. As we can see, the performance is relatively higher for both the model net 40 and model net 10 data uh, Worth to note that model net 10 is a subset of model net 40 data And the red shows the cross view feature distance and uh, uh, analysis. Analyze the MDP uh, indicates the mean pair distance uh, of positive samples, and the negative MDP uh, demonstrates the distance of negative samples. So, as we can see, our model can achieve the high performance okay. for this pretest task. And at last, uh, we we conducted the uh, uh, performance uh, experiments on the two different downstream tasks, including the part sanitation and the 3D object classification task. This table shows the results of part sanitation on the shape net dataset with different amounts of uh, labeled training data available. So as we can see for all the tasks, the performance for the part sanitation can be significantly improved by using our CFC for learned weights as a pre-trained model. And we further show the performance of uh, classification on the model net set uh, 40 dataset and compared with the state art on supervised feature method and a supervised feature learning method. As we can see, our proposed model can outperform all, outperform all the other uh, safe super learning methods on the model net 40 dataset. We also conducted the feature realization for both image modality and plant cloud that uh, modality. And the way indicates how many images are used to represent uh, uh, one object. And the same, same color indicates the, uh, indicates the objects that belong to the same semantic class. In summary, we propose a new schema to explore using the cross model and cross-way correspondence to the set super learning and ex extensive experiments on different tasks demonstrate the effectiveness of our proposed model. Thanks for our answer. Thank you. So we come.
move on to the next uh, next uh, speaker and uh, uh, reminded to uh, to write the questions in the chat if you have some then we can ask them at the end of the session so the second is id7 uh, adaptive intermediate representations for uh, video understanding Can you see the slides? Yes. All right. Hi, I'm Johanna Kongasbunda, and I'm presenting our work on adaptive intermediate representations for video understanding. Uh, this work was done at Google by myself and my colleagues, AJ Pierre Giovanni, Rico Janskowski, Michael Rio, and Anelia Angelova. In action recognition, the task is to predict an action class for a video clip. In this task, the input has very high dimensionality, and the model is given only a single class label as a supervision signal for the entire clip. Therefore, the model has to implicitly learn a wide variety of concepts from the input data, objects, people, motion, and their relationships uh, through time. As an example of uh, an explicit intermediate representation, optical flow has been used extensively in two-stream architectures. Optical flow is often pre-computed using an algorithm optimized for the quality of optical flow itself, rather than the downstream video understanding task. As an addition to motion information, knowledge about the presence and location of people and objects should also be highly relevant in understanding the activity in a video sequence. In air streams, that's short for adaptive intermediate representation streams, we explicitly learned two intermediate representations, optical flow and semantic segmentation. We optimize these intermediate representations jointly with the downstream action recognition task and find the optimal loss weighting for training via evolutionary search. Importantly, after training the network and learning the corresponding intermediate representations, the network requires only RGB inputs at inference time. The Airstream model consists of three independent streams of computation. An RGB stream is optimized only towards the final action recognition task without any intermediate constraints. The two other streams, in addition to being optimized towards the final task, each produce an intermediate output, optical flow and semantic segmentation. Each action recognition tower has an individual loss with respect to the final action recognition target. Additionally, each intermediate representation can have its own loss that is optimized for the specific task. These features from each of the three action recognition towers are combined to produce the final prediction. And this framework can be further extended to use other intermediate modalities such as human pose. Using semantic segmentation as inputs in a video understanding task is difficult since frame-by-frame uh, -frame annotation of object settings is very expensive for large video data sets. In our work, we propose to use an off-the-shelf trainer model to generate these annotations at training time as an additional supervision signal. However, since the model learns to generate the semantic labels itself, at test time, an external mod the trainer model is not needed. When training this model, we set out to find whether using explicit intermediate representations help the final task. And we conducted an ablation study on the HMDB dataset and found that each intermediate representation indeed help. And when combined, they increase the overall performance even further. In contrast to previous two stream architectures that use pre-computed optical flow, we like gradients propagate from the final task through the flow and segmentation compensation. We find that doing this improves performance when using each modality separately and when using them all together. This method allows the network to learn objects and flow features that are more specific to the action recognition task than using pre-trained networks or non-differentiable flow algorithms. When comparing to other methods on commonly used action recognition data sets, we find that Airstreams either upperforms or is competitive with the state-of-the-art methods. So in summary, we propose a new architecture to utilize intermediate representations for any video understanding task. Additionally, we found that semantic segmentation and optical flow help with the final task of action recognition that is and that is important to train them jointly with the final task. 
And finally, we show that this method achieves state-of-the-art results on widely used action recognition data sets. Thank you. So we move on to paper ID uh, 10, uh, practical cross-model uh, manifold alignment for robotic uh, grounded language learning. Sounds great. I'll uh, share my video. Uh Okay, audio is missing, I guess. Yeah, we can hear audio. Oh, it, 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 is, is the, the, the audio not working? No, uh, oh, uh, maybe you need to check uh, the checkbox when you share uh, the screen. Let me, me uh, try that again. Uh, so, yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, can you hear? Can you, can no, you guys hear now? No, still not. Oh, uh, is, 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 is there any chance you 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 guys can play the the video? Okay, I can try. Yeah, uh, sorry about that. Yeah, I'm not not sure what's wrong with my uh, Zoom. Uh, no problem. No problem. To unshare now. Hi everyone, I'm Andre Nguyen and I'll be discussing our paper, Practical Cross-Modal Manifold Alignment for Robotic Grounded Language Learning. These are my collaborators and advisors, and uh, this was work done with Buizel and Hamilton uh, in collaboration with the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Robots have a wide variety of sensors um, that capture data that span multiple domains. So in the perception domain, uh, we have RGB images, there's depth information as well, and there is, uh, in the language domain, uh, descriptions of, of objects, for example. And here you, you see some uh, exemplars of what data could be. So uh, um, uh, for a pair, for example, there's a pair RGB image, there's a uh, depth representation of the pair, as well as a uh, description about something uh, relating to the pair. And robotics data is constrained and, and usually uh, scarce because of the rapid iteration of hardware sensors, where every time we, we make a, a hardware sensor update, it's not feasible to collect hundreds of thousands or millions of new data points. So uh, the, the goal here is to find a way to reason across these different uh, domains in a way that is data efficient. To achieve this goal, we make the following contributions. We introduce an easy to implement manifold alignment approach to the grounded language problem. We demonstrate that our method is generalizable to the unsupervised setting. And we show how our approach can benefit from, but does not require pro processing steps, such as proxies analysis, in contrast to some of our baselines. And the approach we took to uh, this problem is a uh, manifold alignment approach, where, um, where we're interested in language grounding so as an example here, you can see uh, some language at the top left and some perceptual data top right, which consists of uh, an RGB image and some depth information. 
And first, they are vectorized by domain-specific, pre-trained, already existing feature extractors, extractors. And they are then embedded uh, to a shared embedding space by uh, alignment models. And we learn these alignment models using a, a cosine triplet loss-based approach where uh, we, we encourage the mappings to map similar concepts to, uh, to a similar space in the shared embedding space and then dissimilar concepts far away from each other. In our paper, we evaluate using metrics that measure both the quality of the manifolds learned as well as uh, the usefulness for the actual grounded language task. We find that this approach uh, works very well in our highly uh, data constrained situations where um, the, the cosine triplet loss method uh, performs much better than, uh, than popular alternatives such as uh, deep uh, CCA and uh, also uh, does not require the use of proxies analysis to, to, to achieve good results, which uh, deep CCA does, for example. On the right side of the slide, um, you, you can see a UMAP plot of various concepts. So a, a dimensionality reduced representation of the shared embedding space. And we can see that um, across language and, and perception, similar concepts are mapped to similar places, even in a dimensionally reduced uh, representation. And this, this shows that our approach is working. We also evaluate our method on the grounded language task and show uh, that it performs uh, the best. We perform some ablation experiments uh, to examine what the exact contribution of proxies analysis is to, oh, to our method as well as to the baselines. We uh, examine the contribution and impact of uh, the feature extractors. And um, so far, the training of the triplet method has assumed uh, the availability of class labels for triplet selection. But we also show that our method can still be trained when um, class ground truth is not available uh, in an unsupervised uh, setting. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. So, we can move to the um, next paper. So it's number 12, uh, which is uh, a progressive knowledge embedded in unified perceptual parsing for scene understanding. We have an author here. Okay, let's try to move to the next first then, and then we maybe go back. Uh, so uh, ID 21, um, radar camera fusion uh, via representation learning in autonomous driving. Okay, hello. Um, hello? Let me share my screen. Hey, sure. hello. Yeah. I'll play the video then. Sure. Okay, same problem as before. You should probably uh, include the audio when you share when you share the video. Oh, uh, I did not. Okay. Yeah, there's a checkbox below again. the sharing uh, window. Okay, let me try again. Yeah. Share sound. Yeah, got it. Let me try again. Hello, yeah. everyone. Perfect. Welcome to our talk at the CBPR 2021. 
We will talk about our study on radar camera fusion via representation learning in autonomous driving. As a formulation of the radar camera fusion problem, we are giving a camera image and a bunch of detected vehicle 2D bounding boxes and a bunch of radar pins. Our goal is to make the associations between the 2D bounding boxes and the radar pins if they correspond to the same vehicle in the scene. The desired association relationships are highlighted as red lines in the image. There are three features to note about our method. First, our method is an object-level fusion method, as opposed to other data-level fusion or feature-level fusion methods. Hence, our method is more amenable to real autonomous driving systems. Second, our method is a learning-based method. Compared to traditional rule-based radar camera fusion methods, our method is less susceptible to performance degradation in challenging scenarios or failure in corner cases. Third, most existing learning-based radar camera fusion methods rely on LiDAR to provide ground truth information. Yet, our method adopts a traditional radar camera fusion methods to automatically generate association ground truths entirely eliminating the need for LiDAR. Our method is based on representation learning. The input features include the raw camera RGB image, the bounding box features, and the radar pin features. We aim at learning representations of each 2D bounding box and each radar pin. Here is an overview of our method. We first use the bounding boxes and the radar pins to create a pseudo image where each feature occupies one image channel and each bounding box and the radar pin has a unique pixel location. Then we concatenate the pseudo image with a raw camera RGB image to form a final pseudo image to be fed into a neural network to perform representation learning. At the last layer of the network feature map, we extract the learned representations for each bounding box and each radar pin at its pixel location. During the training, if one bounding box and one radar pin are associated, we pull together their representations. Otherwise, we push apart their representations. In this way, the association relationships between bounding boxes and the radar pins are encoded at the Euclidean distance between their representation vectors. During inference, we first calculate the affinity matrix between representations of bounding boxes and the representations of radar pins. Then we select the best associated bounding box for each radar pin by looking for the minimum distance. We also designed two mechanisms to enhance performance. First is a loss sampling. To mitigate the labeling noise, we first filter low confidence positive pairs in the ground truth and uh, sample the negative pairs for loss calculation. Second is the uh, ordinal loss. We observe that the relative ordering of the y max of bounding boxes reflects the ordering of the depth of the object in 3D world. Hence, we can enforce the self consistency among the ordering of the bounding boxes and uh, the ordering of the associated radar pins. We encode the self consistency as the ordinal loss and add the loss into the final loss function during training. Here are some quantitative results. For loss sampling, we studied the different sample ratio and the performance gain is 1.1% in terms of the F1 score. For the original loss, the performance gain is 1.8% in terms of the F1 score. Lastly, even though we used the traditional rule-based algorithm to generate ground truth label during the training, our proposed learning-based algorithm significantly outperforms the rule-based teacher by 11.6% in terms of the F1 score. Here are two examples of the predicted associations. Despite the multiple big trucks present in both examples, our proposed algorithm correctly predicted their associations. On the other hand, in the second example, there are two bounding boxes incorrectly associated. The mistakes are largely due to small sizes of the object in the camera image and also the heavy occlusion. Thank you for your attention.
please refer to our paper uh, for further it. details. Thank you. Thank you. Good. So uh, let's move to the next one. I will share. Uh, I will share it. Um, uh, the title is uh, "Cross Model Speaker Verification and Recognition: A Multilingual uh, Perspective." Hi. My name is Shanwaz and now I will present our paper Cross Model Speaker Verification and Recognition of Multilingual Perspective. This work was carried out at Italian Institute of Technology in collaboration with Mohammed Saad Said, Pietro Barrario, Arif Mahmood, Ignazio Gallo, Mohammed Harun Yusuf, and Alessio Dil Bue. A strong correlation has been found between face and voice of a person which has attracted significant research interest in recent years. However, none of these approaches investigate the effect of multiple languages on this task. Half of the world population is bilingual, with people often switching between their first and second language while communicating. Therefore, it is essential to investigate the effect of multiple languages on computer vision tasks. In addition, existing datasets containing audiovisual information do not provide language level annotations. Therefore, we cannot deploy these datasets to analyze the effect of multiple languages on face-wise association. Since VoxLab is considered a benchmark dataset, therefore, we build a new audiovisual dataset with language annotation with same characteristics as VoxLab. Multilingual audiovisual dataset provide data of 154 celebrities in three languages English, Hindi, Urdu. The collected videos cover a wide range of unconstrained, challenging multi speaker environments, including political debate, press conferences, outdoor interviews, quiet studio interviews, drama, and movie clip. It is also interesting to note that the visual data spans over a vast range of variation, including poses, motion blur, black background clutter, video quality, occlusion, and lighting conditions. In addition, videos are degraded with real-time noise like background chatter, music overlapping speech, and compression artifacts. Multilingual audio-visual dataset consisting of video and audio recording with a large number of celebrities speaking more than one language in the world. The proposed dataset paves the way to analyze the impact of multiple languages on face and voice association. Then we propose a cross-model verification approach to analyze the impact of multiple languages in order to answer the following question. Is face voice association language independent? We extract face and voice embedding from two sub network trained on face and voice sample from the multilingual audio visual data set. Afterward, we build a shallow two branch network on top of these embeddings in order to reduce the gap between them in order to establish a baseline. The shallow architecture consists of two branches, each composed of a fully connected layer with weight matrices. In addition, layers are separated by RILU followed by L2 normalization. We propose an evaluation protocol for a cross-model verification method in order to analyze the impact of multiple languages on face and voice association. The multilingual audiovisual dataset is divided into train and test split consisting of disjoint identities from the same language, typically known as unseen, unheard configuration introduced by Negroni et al. At inference time, the network is evaluated on a heard and completely unheard language. The protocol is more challenging than previously known unseen, unheard configuration due to the presence of an unheard language in addition to the disjoint identities. 
we evaluate the two branch network on a cross model verification method between faces and voices in order to measure the performance on heard and unheard configuration of multilingual audio visual data set we observe performance drop across two split which clearly demonstrate that association is not language independent we observe that the performance degradation is due to the data distribution of two languages typically known as domain shift moreover the model does not generalize well to other unheard languages however the performance is still better than random verification which is not trivial considering the challenging nature and configuration of proposed evaluation protocol we present our work on association between faces and voices with multiple languages please visit our web page for data set and more information okay thank you thank you so um, uh, we move on to the next one which is id 31 uh, the name is AP, APs, Audiovisual uh, Persons Search in Untrimmed Video. Okay, so give me a second to share my screen. Sorry, can you see my screen? No, no. Uh, for a while we saw it, but then okay, stop. Give, give me a second, please. Uh, uh, this is the bird. Okay, I think you can see my screen now. Yes. Okay, so just let me meet. Presentation for apes, audiovisual person. Hi, this is the presentation for apes, audiovisual person search in Antrim video. This is a collaboration between Caos University, Universidad de los Andes, and Adobe Research. Apes is a novel benchmark for audiovisual re-identification. It is composed of 144 untrained videos for about 15 minutes, all of them obtained from Hollywood movies. In total, we associate more than 30,000 face track with about 26,000 voice segments that correspond to about 2,000 individual identities. We also provide an audiovisual benchmark for person search. Ultimately, we show it is beneficial to fuse both modalities. The key element in APES is that it enables the person re-identification task based on face features, body features, speech patterns, or a mixture of them. In APES, we detect frame by frame each of the individuals, and we also provide a dense temporal label of each of their speech events. This means we can relate every person detection and every speech event to a single identity. This enables the standard visual re-identification task where we rely strictly on visual patterns. But more interesting, this allows for audiovisual re-identification where we can mix both domains into the same task. When we compare apes to similar datasets, we see it is bigger not only in the number of instances and the number of tracklets, but also in the number of total identities. In APES, we relate each visual identity to at least a few speech events. However, we realize that about 25% of the visual identities remain silent during the whole clip. Finally, we also realize there is a bias in apes towards adult males. However, it covers a wide range of demographics. 
our baseline uses a standard true stream network and a triplet loss. The true stream networks handles the modality fusion, while the triplet loss estimates a similarity metric between the identities. Finally, we create three configurations for APES. Weak, where we use the ground truth from a single tracklet. Within, where we use the ground truth from every tracklet in the video. And across, where we enhance the number of false positives using the whole dataset. Our experimental results show that the voice matching is a very hard task, but is complementary with the visual matching, achieving very precision results and better mean AP scores. The dataset, code, annotations, and model baseline are all publicly available in GitHub. Okay, thank you. So um, we move to ID32. Um, I will play the video for the speaker. And the title is uh, 3D hand pose estimation via align latent space injection and uh, kinematic uh, uh, losses. Professor Yulas, and I would like to present. Hello, my name is Andreas Ryulas, and I would like to present you our latest work, 3D Handball's estimation via aligned latent space injection and kinematic losses. First, I'm going to give an introduction on 3D Handball's estimation from RGB images. Then I'm going to describe our method and result. Finally, I'm going to present our conclusions. From an RGB image of a hand, our goal is to estimate each 3D hand pose. However, this is challenging because of difficulties in depth estimation, self-occlusions, and differences in background and illumination. Therefore, we propose the use of AES and adversarial learning in order to disentangle and align the latter space. Moreover, we implement an overvide decoder that improves on the performance of a wide network. And finally, we introduce kinematic restrictions in the form of lost terms. The proposed method follows a multi-stage training process where the model undergoes through A, the disentanglement stage, B, the variational alignment stage, and finally, the refinement stage. First stage, we aim to disentangle the RGB images to two latent spaces, the post-specific information and the irrelevant RGB context information. An RGB to pose via is trained alongside a pose to pose via while it discriminated disentangles the Latin spaces. At the second stage, we aligned the disentangled pose specific Latin subspace with a true 3D hand pose Latin space. Uh, this is possible by the use of two variational alignment components that are employed to project each Latin space to a new one. The training is done using a shared decoder. Finally, in the refinement stage, we restrict the model from predicting impossible 3D hand poses by employing two loss terms, the kinematic chain space loss and the geometrical loss. The kinematic chain space is an alternative way of 3D scaling representation that contains the inner product of two bone vectors and the scaled angular representation of the other joints. The KCS loss then leverages this representation and directly restricts the 3D hand pose estimation prediction. Similarly, the geometric loss is based on an alternative spatial representation that models the relationship among the 3D joints of a hand. Finally, we implemented a novel decoder which can function inside any wire, the injection decoder. This decoder improves the performance of a wire by allowing the construction of a more descriptive latent space and by enabling a better flow of gradients. We evaluated the proposed method on two publicly available datasets, the rendered hand pose dataset and the stereo hand pose tracking benchmark. Moreover, we utilized two most common metrics, the mean endpoint error and the area under the curve on the percentage of correct kick points. RHD dataset contains around 44,000 synthetic images with a resolution of 320 by 320. On the other hand, the SDB dataset is significantly smaller than the RHD, containing 18,000 images. However, the subject depicted 
in those images is a real one. Both datasets will utilize the same pre-processing as well as data augmentation. The image encoder is a ResNet 18 and on the other hand the pose encoder as well as the injection decoder and the discriminator are full connected layers. Finally, the variation alignment components consist of wires. We conducted a thorough ablation study in order to prove that each individual component is significant in the final post prediction. Our full method produces better results than previous state of the art, both in mean and pair results, as well as in our comparisons. We also provide a qualitative comparison, both on RHD and STB. In conclusion, the proposed approach achieves improved 3D hand pose estimation results, as well as cross modal alignment between RGB images and ground truth 3D hand poses by initially disentangling the pose specific information from the RGB via adversarial learning, then by utilizing variational mappers to align the disentangled cross modal Latin space with the truth 3D hand pose Latin space, and finally, the predicted hand poses are refined with two losses that impose physiological and geometrical kinematic constraints. In addition, a novel injection decoder is proposed that affects considerably the pose estimation results. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. And uh, we try to go back to the missing one. I think it was uh, uh, ID 12. Is there any uh, author of the paper? Otherwise, I can run the video and then hopefully he will uh, show up at the poster for questions. In this paper, we have presented a novel framework for handling the problem of scene understanding. The key idea is that our work formulates a novel progressive knowledge embedded representation learning framework that incorporates different level knowledge graph into the learning of network at the corresponding level. This not only helps to endow the deep model with learned relationships mined under the guidance of the knowledge graphs, but also provides a solution for scene understanding. Extensive experiments on the widely used Broden and Dataset demonstrate the superiority of our framework over existing state-of-the-art methods. I received the B.S. degree from the University of Electronic Science and Technology of China, Chengdu, China, in 2012 and the Ph.D. degree from the University of Chinese Academy of Sciences, UCAS, Beijing, China, in 2017. From September 2015 to January 2017, he was supported by UCAS as a joint supervision PhD student in Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, Troy, New York, USA. I am currently an assistant professor with School of Intelligent Systems Engineering. Sun Yat-sen University. My research interests include computer vision and machine learning. Human can naturally understand scenes in depth with the help of various knowledge accumulated and by a comprehensive visual concept organization including category labels and different level attributes. 
This inspires us to unify professional knowledge at different levels with deep neural network architectures progressively for seen understanding. Different from the general embedding approaches, we construct different knowledge graphs for different levels of vision tasks by organizing the rich visual concepts accordingly. We employ a gated graph neural network and relational graph convolutional networks to propagate node messages for different levels of tasks and generate progressively different levels of knowledge representation through the graph. Compared with existing methods, our framework has a main appealing property leading to a novel progressive knowledge embedded representation learning framework that incorporates different level knowledge graphs into the learning of networks at Okay, I take the responsibility to stop this. I mean it's just uh, I mean if you if you want to read the paper you can find it in the uh in the archive, right? So, uh, I guess we have uh, uh, we have done with the with the oral session. So we have some uh, um, some questions uh, from uh, an old uh, uh, paper for uh, I think uh, uh, ID ten paper. Uh, I I ask if uh, if the if those that want to ask a question maybe can they speak up the question? So it's maybe making it more articulated that what I would do by reading it. So maybe Matthew Cowell, are you here? Or maybe Michael, are you are you here for, for a question? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, the question was uh, to, uh, to the uh, ID7 and post 10 and on this adaptive intermediate representation for video understanding. So, so it's clear that adding mode improves results, yeah? For, yeah, for in the training set, uh, you're adding semantic semantic loss and optical flow loss. So my question was, could you comment on the training time that the gain uh, compared to the gain you got and um, about on the increasement of the training time. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, so it's it's definitely true that the uh, adding the different modalities uh, increases training time compared to a to a single uh, modality. Uh, however, um, uh, in this net in this network, each of the sub networks are actually quite small. So, so the overall overall size of the network and thus the overall training time is, is quite comparable with, uh, with other uh, state-of-the-art methods. But um, I don't have a, I can't remember exact numbers how much uh, um, longer the training is with each, each modality. Okay, thanks. And uh, well, uh, I can read a question of uh, Matthew Cole that is not here anymore. Maybe um, it's for the same paper, I guess. So since you update the weights of the flow and segmentation network during training, I was wondering if you tried using the predictions with up, uh, updated weights as the new pseudo labels, or did you just use the off the shelf network pseudo labels of the entire time? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, so we use the um, the uh, trainer model pseudo labels for the for the whole training, but I think this is a really good idea uh, to to uh, um, you know like propagate back the uh, the, the learned uh, the learned labels and and learn from that. I think it's a great idea. Thank you. Okay, unfortunately, he's not here, so maybe. <laughs> Uh, he will follow up maybe through the email or maybe at the poster session. Uh, I think we have another, I have time for another question. We have still one minute before the next uh, uh, keynote. Uh, um, 
Okay, so maybe I, I, I wanted to ask uh, questions to ID21. Uh, so uh, how, how big is the date? I mean, are, are you here? One, so rather camera fusion via the representation learning in autonomous driving. Okay, if you are not here, I can come to the poster then. Okay, so yeah, that's that's the probably the problem also with these uh, uh, virtual conferences. Uh, you don't have the feeling of uh, of the people around you, and it's very lame sometimes. But yeah, um, okay, we can. I think we can move on. Uh, I leave the floor to Bodo to, that we hear when produce the next keynote. Yes, exactly. I hope you can hear me. And Costas yes. already entered here, and I can also see his live cam already. So yes. it's a pleasure for me to introduce Costas uh, to our workshop here. And for those who don't know Costas, who so basically did his um, um, diploma degree in Athens around 1986. Then he went to Germany for a while to um, Karlsruhe, where he worked with Hans Helmut Nagel in the domain of optic flow estimation and motion estimation and did his PhD in 1992. And then he went to Kiel University, which is in the northern part of Germany. And just for curiosity, this was the first time where I met Kostas because while he was there, an assistant professor, I did my master's degree in the same lab. But unfortunately, I was not able to do my master's with him because he left to the University of Pennsylvania. And there he climbed up the career ladder from an assistant professor, associate professor, up to the director of the GRASP lab. And um, I think he, everyone or many people know him from his works on geometry and especially now the coupling with deep learning, motion estimation, 3D pose estimation, and these things. So, Kostas, thanks for coming to our workshop and giving um, a live talk. And we're looking forward to your presentation on the domain of event versus frame-based computer vision. So you should be allowed to share your screen. Thank you very much, Bodo, for the nice introduction. And uh, thank you for organizing also this uh, workshop. Uh, computer vision has been quite uh, dogmatic in using uh, only uh, vision. Sometimes using other sensors, uh, we have uh, regarded it as cheating, but I think right now multimodal is uh, uh, more uh, uh, important than ever. And we have the techniques also either to combine or also even to compare them and see uh, how what one can get from every modality. Just one second. All right. And... And screen share and keynote. Yes, this uh, is really good. It's full screen mode, perfect. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so I'm gonna talk today about uh, uh, two modalities. The one is what uh, all of us know, which is a video with full frames, and the other is event-based cameras. Uh, so, and uh, I will start uh, my, <coughs> my motivation with uh, 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 what happens uh, in the actual biological eye. Uh, around here in the University of Pennsylvania, around 15 years ago, uh, they had uh, measured uh, the uh, optical uh, nerve uh, bandwidth of the guinea pig, uh, which was estimated uh, uh, to be about one megabits per second. And uh, the guinea pig has about 10 to the fifth uh, ganglion cells, which uh, you see here on the left. Uh, and uh, when uh, uh, you extrapolate it to the human eye, which has uh, 10 to the six, like 1 million about human ganglion cells, and uh, you assume that about, uh, you can assume a linear actually growth in the information that the, uh, uh, that rises to 8.75 megabits per second, uh, which is definitely as a raw signal, uh, not uh, compared to the compressed signal you see on Netflix, 
but the zero signal is uh, much lower than the like one uh, gigabit per second that we get from a pure like high definition signal. So uh, definitely the human eye does not does not transfer uh, frames. And uh, we have some evidence about it uh, beyond just measuring uh, with electrodes. So this is one of the uh, very famous uh, Troxler illusions uh, published in 1804. If you concentrate for, I think four or five seconds are enough uh, on the black uh, cross, you're gonna see uh, all the color uh, blobs uh, around uh, disappearing. This is not something like a motion after effect. This is a purely like a capture effect at the sensor level, which uh, is uh, the following, that uh, the only reason you see the black uh, cross is uh, because uh, your eye does uh, still micro movements while it's trying to fixate. And because of these micro movements, the signal changes and our sensor can capture these changes. While in the periphery, where the cones are capturing colors, the colors have the, uh, the cones have much bigger receptive field. So even if the eye slightly moves because the receptive field is so much bigger compared to the fovea, there is slightly any difference integrated inside the receptive field of uh, these uh, cones that are perceiving the colors. So because uh, they, uh, there is no motion, uh, effective motion, uh, the signal disappears. And uh, this is a principle in the signal stimuli uh, of uh, not only the eye, you can see the same that the blurring here will disappear if you try to concept to fixate on the red dot. And uh, this uh, like a uh, uh, principle that uh, uh, sensors in biological system are perceiving only changes, including like tactile sensors or audio uh, is uh, quite now, uh, uh, like uh, uh, proved uh, not only with uh, illusions or uh, like uh, behavioral experiments, but uh, also by measuring directly. Uh, here is measurements from the uh, retinal spike trains uh, from uh, a salamander and a rabbit. Uh, and uh, this is uh, like when this intensity stimulus uh, is shown just as one dot uh, to the salamander or the, or the rabbit, uh, these are the spikes uh, that are uh, recording on the ganglion cells uh, uh, over 50 milliseconds. Uh, left salamander, uh, right uh, rabbit. And uh, these are temporal integrations like firing rates in over several like uh, time windows on the left. So we have both behavioral evidence and uh, also uh, measured evidence that what uh, goes out from biological eye is uh, only spikes. It's not uh, trained. It's not a frame. Uh, so where did frames come from? Uh, frames uh, came mainly from uh, photography uh, and uh, cinema, and particularly in the video, uh, because uh, the frames uh, came uh, from uh, uh, trying uh, actually, for example, in this particular case uh, from uh, Edward uh, Mybridge. Uh, this experiment was done here at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, there are several stories about my bridge uh, life, which you might be interested to, to read. But uh, uh, this first capture like of uh, pretty much video frames, uh, it was uh, done in order to prove that uh, during galloping the legs of the horse are not uh, all of them touching the ground. And in terms of video, not just photography, uh, this is how like the video started and then uh, it uh, uh, like the film started and uh, it evolved into cinema and all the videos we have uh, today. Now, what are problems you have uh, on a video? Uh, obviously, you have uh, uh, the violation of Shannon's theorems. In the even if you have uh, not only in this case, even on the bottom here, where you have a 240 frames per second, the highest commercial, like in every iPhone, slow mo. You can still not perceive here, even more if you see myself right now, you can see it with exactly the same fidget spinner here. Uh, uh, this is a much lower frame rate and you can see it even more pronounced in front of my face. Uh, 
uh, with, due to the several sampling rates that are, you're getting from uh, over Zoom. So traditional cameras were designed definitely uh, uh, for uh, humans uh, to watch uh, for entertainment and uh, uh, not like for robots to act in the environment. And uh, they have uh, fixed exposure times. Uh, they cannot perceive anything between these exposure times. So there is always some uh, millisecond where the camera is blind. And uh, the spatial and the temporal relationships are in, in that case disentangled, which of course it is uh, really beneficial to many applications, but might be not for uh, survival of a robot. So the dynamic range is limited. And uh, even with a four millisecond, uh, you see in the image here on the right, even with a four millisecond exposure in the 240 frames per second, uh, you still uh, get a motion blur. Obviously, when you capture one frame these days from the iPhone, uh, you will not see any motion blur because this is there's a, a lot of computational photography going on. And uh, they consume also a lot of power. So, in uh, about 19, uh, in the middle 80s, uh, Carver Mead uh, at Caltech started the building uh, uh, retinas that uh, imitate the biological eye. And this uh, really abstract here summarizes everything about event based cameras of today. That uh, what we really want to do is to compute the logarithm of the intensity and really uh, capture the difference in these logarithms in time and nothing else. So later on, again, uh, starting from uh, uh, Carver Mead's lab, uh, Toby Delbrick, together with Christoph Posch and uh, Patrick Lichtsteiner, they produced the first 128 by 28 sensor. And you can see exactly here the uh, correspondence between the photoreceptor uh, capturing the logarithm of the intensity as a log potential here. Uh, you see a difference operator here imitating the bipolar uh, cell. And then uh, you have uh, on and off events coming out, depending whether the logarithm of this intensity uh, is uh, greater than something or smaller than something. So this is what you get from the pixel. And if uh, nothing is changing in the pixel, the same way that happened in the color blots uh, in the slide I showed at the beginning, then there is zero information coming out. So at, uh, what happens at one pixel is exactly what you see here. If you have the logarithm of the intensity, as soon as uh, the image uh, exceeds a threshold in increasing, where it produces an on event, or in decreasing, when it produces off events. And this is the whole information that we get. Now, a very basic question is if you forget the top, and if you want to construct really a frame, uh, whether you can construct it just from the events here on the bottom. And uh, uh, let's, let me show you how the, uh, to get a better idea uh, what uh, uh, on the left you see events integrated into frames, but on the right, it is really the continuous uh, flow of events coming in, uh, red is on and uh, 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 blue is off. Here you see uh, while the raw event volume is on the bottom, the X, Y, T. Uh, here you see uh, if you integrate and you really want to produce frames out of these events, uh, the one millisecond integration, the two milliseconds and the five millisecond. And in the five millisecond, you immediately see also the starting of uh, creating a blur, even if the original events didn't have any notion of blur. And uh, these days, uh, you have, uh, we are very lucky, and I will present some uh, examples of these cameras also the, uh, at the end. Uh, we are very happy to have even event cameras uh, of uh, one megapixel, like the uh, Prophecy here, 1280 by 720, the Samsung, and the Celebixel. And uh, their power consumption is unbelievably low. It is, you see, even in the uh, uh, Samsung here, which is 130 milliwatt. This is definitely less than uh, like the one watt you get uh, like in a regular like uh, point gray slash clear camera uh, these days. Uh, and here on the bottom, you get uh, the bandwidth in uh, uh, a mega event, which is obviously growing continuously with these uh, cameras having even more spatial resolution. 
So the very basic question is how can we recover the original frame? Because this will tell us also how much, uh, this might tell us how much information we lose. And uh, if uh, we see again, this is how, what happens with the frame uh, in uh, as integration time, when uh, we have a continuous a frame-based camera, where we just uh, integrate over the intensity over a specific time. And here is what we get as the, as the events, uh, where we can pretty much, uh, the, the idea is that we can produce a frame if possible at, at every single uh, time point when we have an event. So this is the simplest event generation. Uh, uh, this is the simplest event generation model that you can get that if the log intensity is uh, greater than a specific level plus the threshold, it creates an event. Uh, after that, uh, this log intensity is reset again. And uh, if you just want to do uh, like a very naive integration, then the only thing you have to do is to, uh, uh, to add this uh, threshold. And uh, by the way, this threshold uh, is not the same for negative and positive. That's why you see this difference here in green and red. But uh, this is the reconstructed signal you get. But you start from somewhere where you really don't know the zero here is completely arbitrary because uh, you don't uh, know the DC component <coughs> of this uh, signal. So in addition, you have uh, a lot of uh, like noise and uh, there are several approaches now in the literature using a neural network, which is though not uh, asynchronous, uh, meaning that again, you have to bucket everything in, uh, uh, in frames and then process it or in volumes. But if you want something completely asynchronous that would run really at every pixel, what you can do is just uh, multiply with this uh, exponential uh, like uh, fading filter here. And uh, we constructed uh, like uh, uh, this experiment in order really to uh, uh, see what exactly is happening. Uh, see also this uh, lack of uh, lack of uh, any texture here, which uh, will be used in the visualization here. So this is the lack of any texture. If uh, you see, uh, if you just add all the events, and you have like infinite memory at every pixel, obviously you're gonna see always this ghost image. And, uh, but if you apply an exponential filter, then this ghost image disappears. The only problem is that this uh, ghost uh, image, uh, we don't have any idea about what it might be because there are no events. So by default uh, here, it assumes uh, like a zero like gray. So, a much better actually tackling of the uh, of uh, the noise, we discovered that uh, it can be done uh, by a bilateral filter, like the ones we used uh, in computer vision in combination with a Gaussian uh, kernel. So you see the bilateral filter here that uh, it is non-linear, it uses the actual intensities, but it can be really uh, 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 applied at every event, uh, at any at, uh, at every time. So what you do is uh, at this uh, we update a whole frame at uh, every event, independent what is the timestamp of uh, this event. And uh, this is uh, you see here that we get a much uh, clearer signal with this bilateral filter. And uh, this is uh, uh, we showed here actually without even exponential to show that uh, the bilateral filter uh, helps also in fading. Actually, this ghost image is from infinite memory. Uh, another filter, the complementary filter, is uh, applied by uh, Cedric Sherling and uh, Robert Mahoney. Uh, this is probably one of the most uh, non-neural uh, best reconstruction. What you see on the upper left is a raw frame from the image frame of the DVS. Some of these cameras produce also frames. Uh, you see that uh, the, it is, uh, you can hardly see because of the integration what is, uh, 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 who, uh, whether it is a person that is running or any other object. And this is a reconstruction using the frames. The frames are used in order to not use any like ghost image for the PC component. And even here where you see everything assumed gray because there is no information, is the reconstruction from events only. And this is the pure events integrated into frames. And you see, even from pure events, we get really very well the silhouette of the running person 
by very, one can get by very simple, uh, like uh, asynchronous uh, uh, convolution. Probably the most uh, up-to-date work on that, and uh, I have really to present it as a state of the art, uh, is uh, a work using an attention mechanism uh, by David Scaramuza's group, which will be presented this week at CVPR, which, can, uh, which uses uh, 28 frames per second color video, and uh, it uh, uh, is, uh, which can be interpolated uh, pretty much at uh, any temporal resolution. Uh, and you see, so this is the input, uh, like sparse uh, frames and uh, dense, uh, uh, like particles. And uh, this is uh, the output that you can reconstruct. Um, I found this extremely impressive. And I think this is one of the future application uh, of uh, super time resolution. Uh, by using really minimal, like uh, self-supervised uh, learning, as opposed to using a lot of like uh, uh, other like uh, training for that. Uh, that uh, is really very, very impressive. And there are many videos in their website to watch. Now, how can we uh, go beyond just uh, reconstructing the frames? What else can we extract? And uh, the second thing uh, that I'm gonna present is the optical flow. So for the optical flow, the problem uh, is that we don't have really any photometric consistency. Uh, so one question is, uh, what is the constraint we use to compute the motion? And the second is that uh, even if you uh, uh, want to use neural networks, for example, where of course you're gonna use, uh, uh, and you don't have ground truth optical flow, how can you do it in a self-supervised uh, way? And uh, we had a sequence of papers on that on event-based learning of optical flow, and later also on depth and uh, ego motion, uh, with uh, starting using uh, both frames and events in the EV flow net, and then using events uh, only. So one question you get uh, when you are working directly with events without reconstructing first frames uh, is uh, what is the input representation? As you have seen, these events are coming as a continuous stream, and uh, might be if you, if you work uh, asynchronously, we can work with this stream. We can really apply a convolution filter at every single new event. But uh, if we want to have a neural approach, then uh, somehow we have to bucket these uh, 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 this, uh, uh, events. And we are coming back uh, to something that uh, it is again uh, non-asynchronous. Uh, 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 it is an XYT volume where we bucket uh, this uh, on and off events uh, into a volume like the one here on the right. And uh, uh, we have tried also with other representations like a firing rate, which is so much used uh, in general in neuroscience, but we have found that having a, 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 a volume of uh, pretty much, I think 18, uh, uh, of 33 milliseconds uh, uh, is uh, the best. So our architecture for optical flow is the input is this volume uh, where we have nine channels for on events and nine channels for off events uh, over uh, this particular time window. And uh, we use uh, this uh, uh, unit uh, architecture where we have losses in increasing resolution in the decoder. And uh, we can produce either only the optical flow at the end or the optical flow plus the depth if uh, we also have a regressor like in the SFM learner for the rotation and the translation here. So this runs in about uh, 20 Hertz, much slower than what we want from an event-based uh, system, uh, but uh, it produces quite uh, like uh, uh, interesting results, which I'm gonna show to you. I see that, uh, uh, so for, uh, for the loss, uh, what uh, uh, we use, and there is uh, also quite a good survey about this uh, on uh, Davides uh, and Guillermo's uh, Matthias paper, uh, is that uh, after you predict the flow, what you can do is uh, warp the images. This is what you see here. So for every, uh, for every event, you can warp it with a predicted flow. And what you really want is that the blur in this uh, warped volume here is minimum. 
There are several measures you can compute for the blur. You can compute the variance, uh, uh, or you can compute it like an average timestamp. Uh, but uh, this is the basic idea for a loss. So input uh, is the volume of bucketed events. Uh, output uh, is uh, uh, the optical flow is predicted and the loss that is used for uh, optimization during training uh, is minimization of the uh, blur of the warped event volume. So this is, uh, these are the results you see here. You observe that uh, uh, the, uh, you cannot even with a, uh, with a regular video, you cannot even see the direction of the motion. And here you would turn off the lights and with very minimal signal, which produces still differences of log intensities, uh, we can compute uh, the optical flow. Uh, you can see it back here. So, these are uh, uh, comparisons with uh, like the ANF law. And in the meantime, there are even better approaches and state of the art of uh, dense optical flow to compare. Uh, and uh, the orange is uh, when uh, we use uh, for the supervision, not the warping of the events, but the warping of images themselves. And the blue is uh, uh, the gray is uh, when we have uh, uh, really just a compensation motion, the, the minimization of the blur of purely event volumes. So this is the MVSEC data set. Uh, in the meantime, there is the DSEC data set from uh, uh, Davide's group, uh, and there is also the prophecy data set, but the DSEC has also like a, a, a um, uh, ground truth the way we, we presented it. What we have found out is that uh, uh, oops. Uh, we can, we can uh, even uh, while we have trained this network uh, only on flying. Uh, sequences uh, and on sequences uh, with uh, driving a motorcycle or a, or a car, we can still produce quite impressive optical flow in very, very challenging situations like uh, this one here uh, with the computation, uh, not so much of the flow on uh, the uh, uh, on the saturated area, but uh, with the flow on the on the tree. So this is a, a sequence from a, a driving during the night with a motorcycle. Uh, unfortunately, at this resolution, uh, you hardly get uh, any events uh, in, uh, on the surface of the road, except the lanes. But with increasing resolution of uh, the event cameras, uh, this is getting better and better. Uh, this is uh, including the prediction uh, of uh, uh, like the uh, focus of expansion which uh, you see on the right here. And this is the ground truth. And uh, including, uh, this is the event image. And this is like the deep blur, the event, uh, like a uh, volume that uh, uh, is produced after warping the events. So what was surprising is, although we, uh, we trained in uh, just uh, like, uh, uh, flying and driving uh, uh, sequences, uh, we got amazing results uh, when uh, we had uh, these uh, sequences of uh, pouring water. This is uh, really a sequence with an amazing detail when you, you see the events. You can see all the water flying out. Uh, you can see the turbulence uh, on the bottom. And uh, this is what we get uh, by just applying uh, a network that was trained uh, on driving sequences and flying sequences on capturing uh, the water. You see clearly the turbulence at the begin at the, the bottom here. Uh, and uh, I think uh, in terms of like uh, physics and biology, there is a lot of such sequences that the event events can capture much better. And uh, this is compared because we talk here in this talk about events versus frame again. Uh, this is the optical flow here. Uh, I think we used the uh, uh, raft, the AFT, uh, dense optical flow from a slow mo sequence of an iPhone, the most uh, uh, recent one, the, the iPhone 12, uh, from uh, by using a regular dense optical flow, frame based on the left here. 
and uh, event based uh, on the right without using any frame. And uh, you see here that uh, the, the frame based optical flow, although it is dense, uh, it is uh, really does not capture anything from what's happening inside the bottle or very sporadically. And uh, the reason is that the photometric constraint that we use because of so many reflections and uh, refraction that is during the bottle, it's just not captured while it is still captured at the particle level uh, and not a very small window when we talk about uh, this, uh, when we pursue the motion of these events. I find it really striking that uh, we, first even that we get that this is not even trained on liquids and uh, left um, also that we are doing much better than these uh, beautiful sequences we get from the, uh, from the iPhone. By the way, this is also quite uh, heavily engineered. This is uh, the end, end effect of the sequence after there is a lot of computational photography going on on the iPhone. Uh, so this is again a comparison between uh, flow using events on the right and flow versus frames on the left. Now, just to finish with the synchronous processing, I think I'm over regarding time. Uh, we don't want really to use this uh, big buckets of time just to use neural networks. So we take uh, the filters from the first layer here and we apply them async with a synchronous convolution. These are like the filters. Uh, that we have learned uh, for this powerful optical flow algorithm. And we apply it more as a, to produce like a, a saliency mask here on the right, which does not have any supervision. The only supervision here is still only the flow loss. And uh, you can see, for example, uh, in this uh, case here, where you see all this background noise or any other events in the sequence that uh, by using this, we can really filter almost 100% or 99% of the events. It's very important to reduce the bandwidth. And we can still capture the motion of the UAV that is passing through. You're going to see it here right now. And uh, this is using only the first layer of a learned filter. So this is uh, before we go even directly to asynchronous learning, we want to exploit the synchronous neural network learning, convolutional network learning to produce masks that we use in an asynchronous way. A step further, what uh, we try to do is uh, to combine uh, both a, a sp uh, not only uh, asynchronous convolutions, but a real spike in neural network. Uh, this is uh, Intel, he has, is, has a real implementation of that. And in collaboration with Purdue, we had a mixed uh, uh, like uh, convolutional plus uh, spiking neural network for computing optical flow. These are very good results from the last uh, ECCV. Uh, and uh, just to let you know, Sony is uh, really getting into the events and uh, they are producing together with Prophecy an event-based vision sensor. Uh, I'm finishing. Uh, Samsung has uh, already selling in Europe an event-based like surveillance, uh, part of the smart things. Uh, this you can buy for just 150 uh, euros. Uh, we should be aware of power. Uh, here is from an article that shows how much is uh, really consumed in training the recent networks. And uh, if you want to learn more, uh, this is a very nice survey we have put together under the leadership of uh, Guillermo. And uh, I think I'm going to finish here and All thank right. you for your attention yes thanks uh, costas for this very nice presentation um there's one question in the chat uh, francesco are you still around do you want to yes i see this? yeah i see the i see the question uh yeah we had a lot of such sequences uh, uh most of our sequence all all our whole data set as well as the mvsec as well as the recent data set is uh, with background motion. All these computations that you see here is uh, everything is moving. This is the camera moving. And uh, we are computing, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, not only the optical flow, you can see that we can compute the full uh, structure for motion. Where was it? Uh, 
here. So I hope this, uh, uh, everything uh, is just geometry after you capture the motion and you have some good filtering for uh, really uh, eliminating the, uh, the noise. Yes, thanks for the answer. Are there any other questions from the audience? I can't see any hands. Uh, maybe you can just uh, unmute and, and raise the question if you like. That's maybe I, I just start. Um, so what I was wondering, um, Costas, what do you think is the implicit bias you have when you do the self-supervised learning? So I can imagine lots of scenarios where the geometry is different than what you estimate from the motion blur. Like if you have bird wings and they flap, they go up and down and they don't have a continuous direction or also smoke can have can behave quite differently. So um, yes. how would you rate um, the degree of implicit bias? That's a very good question. And uh, everything really is on the, in this picture. Uh, and the, most of the implicit uh, bias here is really on the global embedding of the scene here in the middle, uh, which you use to decode. Um, our sequences, we were, uh, uh, so there is a balance there between the local flow and the local estimates and uh, the global vector, which uh, really encodes the context here. Uh, and um, uh, and does all the regularization pretty much uh, uh, induced by this implicit bias, which in this case was uh, like uh, driving sequences, pretty much the bias that you get also in Kitty uh, and uh, flying sequences. And uh, indeed uh, uh, for, uh, I think the, the main problem, as long as, uh, so we're very surprised that this works amazingly on the fidget spinner here as well, uh, as well as on the water sequences, which produce this uh, turbulence, which uh, means that uh, uh, this uh, is, uh, I mean, fortunately, this is not a very good uh, context really descriptor. Uh, it's also, quite large as a representation here is uh, 32 by 32 by like, a, I think uh, at least by 12 channels. And uh, that's uh, uh, what, uh, as, as long as we have local coherent motion, uh, it produces pretty good results. Now for the uh, wings of the bird though, and we have such sequences, uh, it, indeed it doesn't do a good job because uh, uh, it uh, also assumes, uh, a, I think for everything that has a rapid change inside this uh, volume, which is inputted, there is most of the bias. So this is phenomenology, what I'm talking right now, but most of the bias is on the temporal constancy rather than the spatial constancy or context. Yes, but this is, just this is just observations. So uh, as long as we have uh, more asynchronous processing, I think this temporal bias will go away. The alternative uh, which is used, which is uh, like the time surfaces uh, uh, is uh, uh, like a traditional more optical flow framework. Uh, it's uh, with uh, only the local pretty much KLT bias, KLT like bias. And uh, that is quite susceptible to noise in events when you have like even sequence like the one that Francesco asked about, uh, like uh, self motion sequence. Yes, thanks. Vittorio. Vito, yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Baldo. Hi, Costas. How are you? Vittorio. Nice to see thank you. you. Okay. Thank you. Good to see no, you. Um, just a quick question, actually, a curiosity. Um, I was really intrigued about these kind of cameras, actually, very, very news and the work, your work and the work of also Davide. What about, um, so since this is a so sensitive to motion, um, uh, I was wondering if it can be used in a way to estimate uh, person gate um, 
in a much more uh, accurate fashion than uh, using uh, RGB cameras, which is actually something which gate was used, uh, was utilized, but uh, didn't work pretty well. And uh, it, of course, depends on the application, but uh, what do you think are applying? Uh, so can event cameras can be in a way utilized to, uh, in a way, model the gate of the person uh, and uh, possibly to distinguish? Yes, yes. Uh, I mean, we have used it only on, uh, uh, on human pose. And Toby also has a data set on human pose. I don't know if anybody has used it in high periodic motion like a gate, but this is definitely, if you look like at this sequence here and how well yeah. the optical flow is computed, uh, uh, I am expecting that, uh, I mean, in terms of frequency, definitely, but uh, in terms of, uh, uh, like actual uh, gate or uh, re-identification by the gate, you really need the spatial resolution that we uh, have been lacking until this year. Mm. Uh, and in particular, if uh, somebody is at a distance. <clears throat> so as, as soon as we get this, uh, like uh, uh, one, right now the one megapixels are still expensive, but you can get a 640 by 480 for like under $1,000. Um, I think as, as soon as the spatial resolution increases, we might have some hope, but it's really a very good uh, direction. Okay. We, we, we try to do it in animals. I mean, that's our, our mm -hmm. main, our main, like, uh, uh, we have a smart aviary and we want to uh, uh, really observe animal behavior, like bird, bird behavior. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Any other questions from the audience? Maybe a final question from, from my side. So this is more or less the unit architecture you're using here. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then there's this post model in there. So what's exactly in the in this post model? You in, invoke some kind of apipolar constraints in there or what are you doing that's, there? That's, uh, we imitated uh, the, uh, the paper called SFM Learner, which has a regressor for uh, uh, like the rotation translation between the two frames, it is an SFM and uh, it's uh, even uh, like it even predicts uh, like a, uh, uh, an absolute translation, like full six degrees of freedom. It predicts also the depth and it takes the depth and the rotation translation and uses this for the flow. Uh, and uh, it uh, works with uh, this instead of working with a just estimated flow. And can it also disentangle the components? Uh, for the rotation and the translation? Yeah, because the way they, they, we write explicitly the optical flow equation, so because of the loss, it is disentangled. Uh, there is no disentanglement constraint directly here in terms of okay. like uh, uh, R1 times R2 is equal R12 or something like this which would be a good, good idea, the, the, the smaller the temporal window becomes. Okay, yes, um, I don't see any further questions or raised hands. So thanks again, Costas, for your time. Thank, thank you very for much, this thank you. Nice presentation and I will hand over back to the organizers. Okay, so I suppose I can close, but also the other organizers and want to say something, please uh, do it. So I would like to thank you all for this nice workshop. We reached the peaks of 70 people, but in average we have 50, 60 people. So the very good attendance. And uh, I hope you find our uh, works interesting uh, for sure. Also the work of our invited speaker, Costas, uh, Rogerio and Lorenzo, uh, very amazing talks. And uh, now we have the poster session. We have all to move to Gatherly. And uh, the poster session starts practically now. And uh, it's not ending at 9 a.m. Europe time. Uh, you can go also over uh, this time. So please, uh, all the presenters uh, can go to the Gatherly to their poster session. And the poster session can last uh, 
as like you want in a way. So uh, Michael, Bodo, Paolo, Pietro, would like to say something? Can you hear me? I think Paolo wants to say something. No, maybe also from my side. So thanks for the organization of the workshop, also to my, my colleagues. So Vittorio and I we were more, more in the back and Paolo and Michael, they really had all the work with the reviews and the organization. So thanks for that again. It's um, yeah. really great. And would I also like to thank all the people attending here to the workshop. And uh, I would also like to wish you a good, um, Good success with the main conference which has come up now and i think there are many interesting talks and papers shown and i hope it is, inspires you for your ongoing research towards your phd or postdoc or whatever you're doing and um, we are basically desperate to meet you again in real life having a real <laughs> workshop uh, being really around and uh, having a chat with you and drinking some some coffee so it's a little bit disappointing to be honest to just have it in a virtual way but yeah. at the moment we have to live with that and we are in good hope that this will change in the future okay keep going to work on multimodality guys so that you know, we can see together each other next time <laughs> we for sure will present uh, also this, uh, this workshop for next edition, the BCVPR or ICCV, we'll see. But anyway, CVPR is also, of course, a, a proper choice, a good choice. So thank you. And again, meet you on Gatherly. Thanks again to my organizers, my colleagues. And bye-bye. Uh, Have a good CVPR conference next week yes bye 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 bye, bye. see you on the poster bye people bye